Chapter One of Jarwin and Cuffy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Jarwin and Cuffy by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter One. On a certain morning, not very long ago, the sun, according to his ancient and admirable custom, rose at a very early hour and, casting his bright beams far and wide over the Pacific lighted up the yellow sands and the verdant hills of one of the loveliest of the islands of that mighty sea it was early morning as we have said and there was plenty of life animal as well as vegetable to be seen on land and sea and in the warm hazy atmosphere but there were no indications of man's presence in that beautiful scene the air was perfectly calm yet the gentle swell of the ocean terminated in great waves which came rolling in like walls of glass and fell on the coral reef like rushing snow wreaths with a roar as loud as thunder thousands of ski birds screamed and circled in the sky fish leaped high out of their native element into the air as if they wished to catch the gulls while the gulls seemingly smitten with a similar desire dived into the water as if they wished to catch the fish it might have been observed however that while the fish never succeeded in catching the gulls the latter very frequently caught the fish and without taking the trouble to kill them bolted them down alive coconut palms cast the shadows of their long stems and graceful tops upon the beach while farther inland a dense forest of tropical plants breadfruit trees bananas etc rose up the mountain sides here and there open patches might be seen that looked like fields and lawns but there were no cottages or villas droves of pigs rambled about the valleys and on the hillsides but they were wild pigs no man tended them the breadfruits the coconuts the bananas the plantains the plums all were beautiful and fit for food but no man owned them or used them for like many other spots in that sea of coral isles and savage men the island was inhabited. In all the wild expanse of ocean that surrounded that island, there was nothing visible save one small, solitary speck on the far-off horizon. It might have been mistaken for a seagull, but it was in reality a raft, a mass of spars and planks rudely bound together with ropes. A boat's mast rose from the centre of it, on which hung a rag of sail, and a small red flag drooped motionless from its summit. There were a few casks on the highest part of the raft, but no living soul was visible. Nevertheless, it was not without tenants. In a hollow between two of the spars, under the shadow of one of the casks, lay the form of a man. The canvas trousers, cotton shirt, blue jacket, and open necktie bespoke him a sailor, but it seemed as though there was nothing left to save the body of the unfortunate tar. So pale and thin and ghastly were his features. A terrier dog lay beside him, so shrunken that it looked like a mere scrap of door matting. Both man and dog were apparently dead, but they were not so in reality, for, after lying about an hour quite motionless, the man slowly opened his eyes. Ah, reader, it would have touched your heart to have seen those eyes. They were so deep-set, as if in great caverns, and so unnaturally large. They gazed round in a vacant way for a few moments until they fell on the dog. Then a gleam of fire shot through them, and their owner raised his large, gaunt, wasted frame on one elbow, while he gazed with a look of eagerness, which was perfectly awful, at his dumb companion. Not dead yet, he said, drawing a long sigh. There is a strange, incongruous mixture of satisfaction and discontent in the remark, which was muttered in a faint whisper. Another gleam shot through the large eyes. It was not a pleasant look. Slowly, and as if with difficulty, the man drew a clasp knife from his pocket, and opened it. As he did so, his brows lowered and his teeth became clenched. It was quite plain what he meant to do. As he held the open knife over the dog's head, he muttered, "'Am I to die for the sake of a dog?' Either the terrier's slumbers had come to an unnaturally at a fortunate moment, or the master's voice had awakened it, for it opened its eyes, raised its head, and looked up in the sailor's face. The hand with the knife drooped a little. The dog rose and licked it. Hunger had done its work on the poor creature, for it could hardly stand, yet it managed to look in its master's face with that grave, simple gaze of self-forgetting love which appears to be peculiar to the canine race. The savage glare of the seaman's eyes vanished. He dropped the knife. "'Thanks, Cuffy. Thanks for stopping me. It would have been murder.' no no my daughter you and i shall die together his voice sank into a murmur partly from weakness and partly from the idea suggested by his concluding words die together he repeated surely it ain't come to that yet what john jarwin are you going to give in that easily are you are you to haul down your colours on a fine day with a clear sky like this overhead come cheer up lad you're young and you can hold out a good while yet hey old dog what say you the dog made a motion that would, in ordinary circumstances, have resulted in the wagging of its tail, but the tail was powerless to respond. 
At that moment a gull flew towards the raft. Jarwin watched it eagerly as it approached. Ah, he muttered, clasping his bony hand as tightly over his heart as his strength would allow, and addressing the gull. If I only had hold of you, I'd tear you from limb from limb and drink your blood. He watched the bird intently as it flew straight over him. Leaning back, he continued slowly to follow his flight, until his head rested on the block of wood which had served him for a pillow. The support felt agreeable. He forgot the goal, closed his eyes, and sank with a deep sigh into a slumber that strongly resembled death. Presently he woke with a start, and, once more raising himself, gazed round upon the sea. No ship was to be seen. How often he had gazed round the watery circle with the same anxious look, only to meet with disappointment. The hills of the coral island were visible like a blue cloud on the horizon, but Jarwin's eyes were too dim and worn out to observe them. Come, he exclaimed, suddenly, grabbing him to his feet. Rouse up, Cuffy. You and I ain't a-going to die without a good fight for life. Come along, my hearty. We'll have another glass of grog. Adam's grog it is, but it has been good grog to you and me, doggy, and then we shall have another inspection of the locker. Mayhap there's the half of a crumb left. The comparatively cheery tone in which the sailor said this seemed to invigorate the dog, for it rose and actually succeeded in wriggling its tail as it staggered after its master, indubitable sign of hope and love not yet subdued. Jarwin went to a cask, which still contained a small quantity of fresh water. Three weeks before the point at which we take up his story, a storm had left him and his dog the sole survivors on the raft of the crew of a bark which had sprung a leak and gone to the bottom. His provision at the time was a very small quantity of biscuit and a cask of fresh water. Several days before this the last biscuit had been consumed, but the water had not yet failed. Hitherto John Jarwin had husbanded his provisions, but now, feeling desperate, he drank deeply of the few remaining drops of that liquid which, at the time, was almost as vital to him as his life's blood. He gave a full draught also to the little dog. "'Share and share alike, doggie,' he said, patting its head, as it eagerly lapped up the water. "'But there's no whittles, Cuffy, and you don't care for baccy, or you should be heartily welcome to a quid.' So saying, the sailor supplied his own cheek with a small piece of his favorite weed, and stood up on the highest part of the raft to survey the surrounding prospect. He did so without much hope, for hope deferred had at last made his heart sick, Suddenly his wandering gaze became fixed and intense. He shaded his eyes with one hand, and steadied himself against the mast with the other. There could be no doubt of it. "'Land ho!' he shouted, with a degree of strength that surprised himself, and even drew from Cuffy the ghost of a bark. On the strength of the discovery, Jarwin and his dumb friend immediately treated themselves to another glass of Adam's grog. But poor Jarwin had his patience further tried. Hours passed away, and still the island seemed as far off as ever. Night drew on, and it gradually faded from his view but he had unquestionably seen land. So, with this to comfort him, the starving tar lay down beside his dog to spend another night, as he had already spent many days and nights, a castaway on the wide ocean. Morning dawned, and the sailor rose with difficulty. He had, for a moment, forgotten the discovery of land on the previous night, but it was brought suddenly to his remembrance by the roar of breakers near at hand. Turning in the direction whence the sound came, he beheld an island quite close to him, with heavy rollers breaking furiously on the encircling ring of the coral reef. The still water between the reef and the shore, which was about a quarter of a mile wide, reflected every tree and crag of the island as if in a mirror. It was a grand, a glorious sight, and caused Jarwin's heart to swell with emotions that he had never felt before. But his attention was quickly turned to a danger which was imminent, and which seemed to threaten the total destruction of his raft, and the loss of his life. A very slight breeze, a mere zephyr, which had carried him during the night toward the island, was now bearing him straight, though slowly, down on the reef where, if he had once got involved in the breakers, the raft must certainly have been dashed to pieces, and he knew full well that in his weak condition he was utterly incapable of contending with such a surf. Being a man of promptitude, his first act on making this discovery was to lower the sail. This was, fortunately, done in time. Had he kept it up a few minutes longer, he must inevitably have passed the only opening in the reef that existed on that side of the island. This opening was not more than fifty yards wide, to the right and left of it the breakers on the reef extended in lines of seething foam already the raft was rolling in the commotion caused by these breakers as it drifted towards the opening jarwin was by no means devoid of courage many a time in days gone by when his good ship was tossing on the stormy sea or scudding under bare poles had he stood on the deck with unshaken confidence and a calm heart but now he was face to face with the seamen's most dreaded enemies breakers ahead Nay, worse, breakers around him everywhere, save at that one narrow passage, which appeared so small, and so involved in the general turmoil, as to avoid scarcely an element of hope. For the first time in his life Jarwin's heart sank within him. At least so he said, in after years, while talking of the event. 
but we suspect that john was underrating himself at all events he showed no symptoms of fear as he sat there calmly awaiting his fate as the raft approached the reef each successive roller lifted it up and dropped it behind more violently until at last the top of one of the glittering green walls broke just as it passed under the bend of the reef nearest the shore jarwin now knew that the next billow would seal his fate there was a wide space between each of those mighty waves he looked out to sea and beheld the swell rising and taking form and increasing in speed as it came on calmly divesting himself of his coat and boots he sat down beside his dog and awaited the event at that moment he observed with intense gratitude to the almighty that the raft was drifting so straight towards the middle of the channel in the reef that there seemed every probability of being carried through it but the hopeless race was somewhat chilled by the feeling of weakness which pervaded his frame now cuffy said he patting the terrier gently rise up my doggy we must make a brave struggle for life it's neck or nothing this time if we touch that reef in passing cuff you and i shall be food for the shark to-night and it's my opinion that the shark as gets us won't have much occasion to boast of his supper the sailor ceased speaking abruptly as he looked back at the approaching roller he felt solemnized and somewhat alarmed for it appeared so perpendicular and so high from his low position that it seemed as if it would fall on and overwhelm the raft there was indeed some danger of this glancing along his sleeve jarwin saw that here and there the edge was looping over while in one place not far off the thunder of its fall had already begun another moment and it appeared to hang over his head the raft was violently lifted at the stern caught up and whirled onward at railway speed like a quart in the midst of a boiling cauldron of foam the roar was deafening the tumultuous heaving had almost overturned it several times jarman held on firmly to the mast with his right arm and grasped the terrier with his left hand for the poor creature had not strength to resist such furious motion it all passed with bewildering speed it seemed as if in one instant the raft was hurled through the narrows and launched into the calm harbour within an eddy at the inner side of the opening swept it round and fixed the end of one of the largest spars of which it was composed on the beach there were fifty yards or so of sandy coral reef between the beach outside that faced the sea and the beach inside which faced the land yet how great the difference the one beach buffeted for ever day and night by the breakers in calm by the grand successive rollers that as it were symbolized the ocean's latent power in storm by the mad deluge of billows which displayed that power in all its terrible grandeur the other beach a smooth sloping circlet of fair white sand laved only by the ripples of the lagoon or by its tiny wavelets when a gale chanced to sweep over it from the land darwin soon gained this latter breach with cuffy in his arms and sat down to a rest for his strength had been so much reduced that the mere excitement of passing through the reef had almost exhausted him cuffy however seemed to derive new life from the touch of earth again for it ran about in a staggering drunken sort of way wagged his tail at the root without however being able to influence the point and made numerous futile efforts to bark in the midst of its weekly gambols the terrier chanced to discover a dead fish on the sands instantly it darted forward and began to devour it with great voracity hello cuffy shouted jarwin who observed him ho oh, hold on you rascal share and share alike you know here fetch it here cuffy had learned the first great principle of a good and useful life whether of man and beast namely prompt obedience that meek but jovial little dog on receiving this order restrained its appetite lifted the fish in its longing jaws and carrying it to its master humbly laid it at his feet he was rewarded with a hearty pat on the head and a full half of the coveted fish for jarvin appeared to regard the share and share alike principle as a point of honour between them the fish was not good neither was it large and of course it was raw besides being somewhat decayed nevertheless both man and dog ate it bones and all with quiet satisfaction nay reader do not shudder if you were reduced to similar straits you would certainly enjoy with equal gusto a similar meal supposing that you had the good fortune to get it small though it was it sufficed to appease the appetite of the two friends and to give them a feeling of strength which they had not experienced for many a day under the influence of this feeling jarwin remarked to cuffy that a man could eat almost anything when hard put to it and that it was now high time to think about going ashore to which cuffy replied with a bark which one might imagine that should come from a dog in the last stage of whooping cough and with a wag of his tail not merely at the root thereof but a distinct wag that extended obviously along its entire length to the extreme point jarwin observed the successful effort laughed feebly and said bravo cuffy with evident delight for it reminded him of the days when that little shred of a doormat in the might of its figure was wont to wag its tail so violently as to convulse its whole body insomuch that it was difficult to decide whether the tail wagged the body or the body the tail but although jarwin made light of his sufferings his gaunt wasted form would have been a sad sight to any pitiful spectator as with weary aspect and unsteady gait he moved about on the sandy ridge in search of more food 
or gaze with longing eyes on the richly wooded island for it must be remembered that her castaway had not landed on the island itself but on that narrow ring of coral reef which almost encircled it and from which it was separated by the lagoon or enclosed portion of the sea which was as we have said about a quarter of a mile wide john jarwin would have thought little of swimming over that narrow belt of smooth water in ordinary circumstances but now he felt that his strength was not equal to such a feat moreover he knew that there were sharks in these waters so he dismissed the idea of swimming and cast about in his mind how he should manage to get across with jarwin action soon followed thought he resolved to form a small raft out of portions of the large one fortunately his clasp-knife had been attached as seamen frequently have it to his belt waist when he forsook the ship this was the only implement that he possessed but it was invaluable with it he managed to cut the thick ropes that he could not have untied and in the course of two hours for he laboured with extreme difficulty a few broken planks and spars were lashed together embarking on this frail vessel with his dog he pushed off and using a piece of plank for an oar sculled himself over the lagoon it was touching even to himself to observe the slowness of his progress all the strength that remained in him was barely sufficient to move the raft but the lagoon was as still as a mill-pond looking down into its clear depths he could see the rich gardens of coral and seaweed among which fish of varied and brilliant colours sported many fathoms below the air too was perfectly calm very slowly he left the reef astern the middle of the lagoon was gained then gradually he neared the island shore but oh it was a long weary pull although the space was so short and to add to the poor man's misery the fish which he had eaten caused him intolerable thirst but he reached the shore at last the first thing that greeted his eye as he landed was the sparkle of the clear spring at the foot of some coconut trees he staggered eagerly towards it and fell down beside a hollow in the rock like a large copper bowl which had been scooped out by it who shall presume to describe the feelings of that shipwrecked sailor as he and his dog drank from the same cup at that sparkling crystal fountain delicious odours of lime and citron trees and well-nigh forgotten herbage filled his nostrils and the twitter of birds thrilled his ears seeming to bid him welcome to the land as he sank down on the soft grass and raised his eyes in thanksgiving to heaven an irresistible tendency to sleep then seized him if there's a heaven upon earth i'm in it now he murmured as he laid down his head and closed his eyes cuffy nestling into his breast placed his chin on his neck and heaved a deep consented sigh this was the last sound the sailor recognized as he sank into profound repose end of chapter one chapter two of jarwin and cuffy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by esther ben simonides jarwin and cuffy by r m ballantyne chapter two island life there are few of the minor sweets of life more agreeable than to awake refreshed and to become gradually impressed with the conviction that you are a perfectly free agent that you may rise when you choose or lie still if you please or do what you like without let or hindrance so thought our hero john jarwin when he awoke on the same spot where he had thrown himself down after several hours of life-giving slumber he was still weak but his weakness did not now oppress him the slight meal the long draught and the deep sleep had restored enough of vigour to his naturally robust frame to enable him while lying on his back to enjoy his existence once more he was on first awaking in that happy condition of mind and body in which the former does not care to think and the latter does not wish to move yet both are pleased to be largely conscious of their own identity that he had not moved an inch since he lay down became somewhat apparent to jarwin from the fact that cuffy's chin still rested immovable on his neck but his mind was too indolent to pursue the thought he had not the most remote idea as to where he was but he cared nothing for that he was in absolute ignorance of the time of day but he cared if possible still less for that food he knew was necessary to his existence but the thought gave him no anxiety in short john and his dog were in a state of quiescent felicity and would probably have remained so for some hours to come had not the setting sun shone forth at that moment with a farewell gleam so intense that it appeared to set the world of clouds overhead on fire converting them into hills and dales and towering domes and walls and battlements of molten glass and gold even to the wearied seaman's sleepy vision the splendour of the scene became so fascinating that he shook off his lethargy and raised himself on one elbow oi cuffy he exclaimed to the yawning dog seems to me that the heavens is afire hope it won't come on dirty weather before you and i get up something in the shape of a hut that minds me doggy he added glancing slowly round him the we must look after procurin of our supper i do believe we've been and slept away the whole day 
Well, well, it don't much matter, seeing that we ain't got no duty to do. No trick of the wheel, no grease in the mass. Worst of all, no splice in the main brace, and no grub. This latter remark appeared to reach the understanding of the dog, for it uttered a melancholy howl as it gazed into his master's eyes. Ah, Cuffy, continued the sailor with a sigh, you've good reason to yell, for the half of a rotten fish ain't enough for a dog of your appetite. Come, let's see if we can't find something more to our taste. Saying this, the man rose, stretched himself, yawned, looked helplessly round for a few seconds, and then with a cheerio, Hello, Cuff, come along, my hearty, went down to the beach in quest of food. In this search he was not unsuccessful, for the beach abounded with shellfish of various kinds, but Jarwin ate sparingly of these, having been impressed, in former years, by some stories which he had heard of shipwrecked sailors having been poisoned by shellfish. For the same reason he administered a moderate supply to Cuffy, telling that it, it weren't safe whittles, and that if they was to be pisoned, it was as well to be pisoned in moderation. The dog, however, did not appear to agree with its master on that point, for it went picking up little tit-bits here and there, and selfishly ignoring the share and share alike compact, until it became stuffed alarmingly, and could scarcely follow its master back to the fountain. Arrived there, the two slaked their thirst together, and then Jarwin sat down to enjoy a pipe, and Cuffy lay down to suffer the well-merited reward of gluttony. We have said that Jarwin sat down to enjoy a pipe, but he did not enjoy it that night, for he discovered that the much-loved little implement, which he had cherished tenderly while on the raft, was broken to atoms in his coat-pocket. In his eagerness to drink home first landing, he had thrown himself down on it, and now smoking was an impossibility, at least for that night. He reflected, however, that it would not be difficult to make a wooden pipe, and that cigarettes might perhaps be made by means of leaves or bark, while his tobacco lasted. So he consoled himself in the meantime with hopeful anticipations, and a quid. Being still weak and weary, he lay down again beside the fountain, and almost immediately fell into a sleep, which was not at all disturbed by the starts and groans and frequent yelps of Cuffy, whose sufferings could scarcely have been more severe if he had supped on turtle soup and venison, washed down with port and claret. Thus do those castaways spend the first night on their island. It must not be supposed, however, that we are going to trace thus minutely every step and sensation in the career of our unfortunate friends. We have too much to tell that it is important to devote our valuable space to everyday incidents. Nevertheless, as it is important that our reader should understand our hero thoroughly, and the circumstances in which we find him, it is necessary that we should draw attention to some incidents, trifling in themselves, but important in their effects, which occurred to John Jarwin soon after his landing on the island. The first of these accidents was, that John one day slipped his foot on a tangled covered rock and fell into the sea. A small matter this, you will say, to a man who could swim, and in a climate so warm that a dip, with or without clothes, was a positive luxury. Most true, and had the wedding been all, Jarwin would have had nothing to annoy him, for at the time the accident occurred he had been a week on the island, had managed to pull and crack many coconuts, and had found various excellent wild fruits, so that his strength, as well as Cuffy's, had been much restored. In fact, when Jarwin's head emerged from the brine after his tumble, he gave vent to a shout of laughter, and continued to indulge in hilarious demonstrations all the time he was wringing the water of his garments, while the terrier barked wildly round him. But suddenly, in the very midst of a laugh, he became grave and pale, so pale that a more obtuse creature than Cuffy might have deemed him ill. While his mouth and eyes slowly opened wider and wider, his hands slapped, first his trousers, then his pockets, then his vest, then his coat, after which they fell like pistol shots on his sides, and he exclaimed in a voice of horror, "'Gone! Ay, there could be no doubt about it. Every particle of his tobacco was gone. It had never been much, only three or four plugs, but it was strong, and he had calculated that, what with careful husbanding and mixed herbs, it would last him for a considerable length of time.' In a state bordering on frenzy, the sailor rushed back to the rock from which he had fallen. The backy was not there. He glanced right and left, no sign of it floating on the sea. And he went head foremost like a determined suicide. Down, down to the bottom, for he was an expert diver, and rioted among the coral groves and horrified the fish, until he well-nigh burst and rose to the surface with a groan and a splutter that might have roused envy in a porpoise. Then down he went again, while Cuffy stood on the shore regarding him with mute amazement. Never did Pearl Diver grope for the treasures of the deep with more eager intensity than did John Jarwin search for that lost tobacco. He remained under water until he became purple in the face, and, coming to the surface after each dive, stayed only long enough to recharge his lungs with air. How deeply he regretted at that time the fact that man's life depended on so frequent and regular a supply of atmospheric air! How enviously he glanced at the fish, which, with open eyes and mouth, appeared to regard him with inexpressible astonishment, as well they might! At last Jarwin's powers of endurance began to give way, and he was compelled to return to the shore, to the great relief of Cuffy, which, miserable dog, if it had possessed the least small amount of reasoning power, must have deemed its master hopelessly insane. "'But why so much ado about a piece of tobacco?' we heard some lady reader or non-smoker exclaimed. 
just because our hero was, and had been since his childhood, an inveterate smoker. Of course, we cannot prove our opinion to be correct, but we are inclined to believe that if all the smoke that had issued from Jarwin's lips, from the period of his commencing down to that terrible day when he lost his last plug, could have been collected in one vast cloud, it would have been sufficient to have kept a factory chimney going for a month or six weeks. The poor man knew his weakness. He had several times tried to get rid of the habit which had enslaved him, and, by failing, had come to know the tyrannical power of his master. He made up his mind never more to strive for freedom, but to enjoy his pipe as long as he lived, to swim with the current, in fact, and take it easy. It was of no use that several men, who objected to smoking from principle, had had themselves gone through the struggle and come off victorious, pointed out that if he went on at his present rate, it would cut short his life. And Jarwin didn't believe that. He felt well and hearty, and said that he was too tough by a long way to be floored by backy. Besides, if his life was to be short, he saw no reason why it should not be a pleasant one. It was vain for these disagreeable men of principle to urge that when his health began to give way, he would not find life very present, and then backy would fail to relieve him. Stuff and nonsense! Did not Jarwin know that hundreds of thousands of old men enjoyed their pipes to the very last? He also knew that a great many men had filled early graves owing to the use of tobacco, but he chose to shut his eyes to this fact. Moreover, although a great truth, it was a difficult truth to prove. It was of still less use that those tiresome men of principle demonstrated that the money spent in tobacco would, if accumulated, form a snug little fortune to retire upon in his old age. John only laughed at this. "'What did he want with a fortin in his old age?' he would ask. "'He would rather work to the last for his three bees, his bread and beer and baccy, and die in harness. "'A man couldn't get on like a man without them three bees, and he wasn't going to afford to deprive himself of none of them. "'Not he. Besides, his opponents were bad argifers. he was bound to say with a chuckle. "'For if, as they said, baccy would be the means of cutting his life short, "'why then he wouldn't never come to old age to use his fortune, even if he should manage to save it off his baccy.' This last argument always brought Jarwin off with flying colours. No wonder, for it was unanswerable, unless he came to love his beer and baccy so much that he became thoroughly enslaved to both. His brief residence on the South Sea Island had taught him, by painful experience, that he was capable of existing without at least two of his three B's, bread and beer. He had suffered somewhat from the change of a diet, and now that his third B was thus suddenly, unexpectedly, and hopelessly wrenched from him, he sat himself down on the beach beside Cuffy and gazed out to sea in absolute despair. We must guard the reader at this point from supposing that John Jarwin had ever been what is called an intemperate man. He was one of those honest, straightforward tars who do their duty like men, and who, although extremely fond of their pipe and their glass of grog, never lower themselves below the level of the brutes by getting drunk. At the same time, we feel constrained to add that Jarwin acted entirely from impulse and kindly feeling. He had little to do with principle, and did not draw towards those who professed to be thus guided. He was wont to say that they— was troublesome fellers always shoving in their oars when they weren't wanted to, and setting themselves up for better than everybody else. Had one of those troublesome fellows presented John Jarman with a pound of tobacco in his forlorn circumstances, at that time he would probably have slapped him on the shoulder and called him one of the best fellows under the sun. "'Cuffy, my friend!' exclaimed Jarman at last with an explosive sigh. "'All the back he's gone, so he'll have to smoke seaweed for the future,' the terrier said. "'Bow, wow!' to this, cocked his ears, and looked earnest, as if waiting for more. "'Come along,' exclaimed the man, overturning his dog as he leaped up. "'We'll go home and have somewhat to eat.' Jarwin had erected a rude hut, composed of boughs and turf, near the fountain where he had first landed. It was the home to which he referred. At first he had devoted himself entirely to the erection of the shelter, and to collecting various roots and fruits and shellfish for food, intending to delay the examination of the island until his strength should be sufficiently restored to enable him to scale the heights without more than ordinary fatigue. He had been so far recruited as to have fixed for his expedition the day following that on which he sustained his irreparable loss. Entering his hut, he proceeded to kindle a fire by means of a small burning glass, with which, in happier times, he had been wont to light his pipe. Very soon he had several roots, resembling small potatoes, baking the hot ashes. With these, a handful of plums, a dozen of oyster-like fish, of which there were plenty on the shore, and a draught of clear cold water, he made a hearty repast, Cuffy coming in for a large share of it, as a matter of course. Then he turned all his pockets inside out, and examined them as carefully as if diamonds lurked in the seams. No, not a speck of tobacco was to be found. He smelt them. The odor was undoubtedly strong, very strong. On the strength of it he shut his eyes, and endeavored to think that he was smoking, but it was a weak substitute for the pipe, and not at all satisfying. Thereafter he sallied forth and wandered about the seashore in a miserable condition, and went to bed that night, as he remarked to his dog, in the blues. Reader, it is not possible to give you an adequate conception of the sensations and sufferings of John Jarwin on that first night of his bereaved condition. He dreamed continuously of tobacco. Now he was pacing the deck of his old ship, with a splendid pipe of cut cavendish between his lips. 
anon he was smoking a meerschaum the size of a hogshead with a stem equal to the length and thickness of the main topmast of a seventy-four but somehow the meerschaum wouldn't draw whereupon john in a passion pronounced it worthy of its name and hove it overboard when it was instantly transformed into a shark with a cutty pipe in its mouth to console himself our hero endeavoured to thrust into his mouth a quid of nagur head which however suddenly grew as big as the cabin skylight and became as tough as gutta percha so that it was utterly impossible to bite off a piece and stranger still when the poor sailor had by struggling got in it in it dwindled down into a point so small that he could not feel it in his mouth at all on reaching this the vanishing point darwin awoke to a consciousness of the dread reality of his destitute condition turning on his other side with a deep groan he fell asleep again to dream of tobacco in some new and tantalizing form until sunrise when he awoke refreshed leaping up he cast off his clothes rushed down to the beach and plunged into the sea by way of revitalizing his feelings during the day john jarwin brooded much over his dreams for his mind was of a reflective turn and cuffy looked often inquiringly into his face that sympathetic doggie would evidently have besought him to pour his sorrows into his cocked ears if he could have spoken but alas for people who are cast away on desert islands the gift of speech has been denied to dogs besides being moody jarwin was uncommonly taciturn that day he did not tell cuffy the result of his cogitations so that we cannot say anything further about them all that we are certainly sure of is that he was profoundly miserable that day that he postponed his intended expedition to the top of the neighbouring hill that he walked about the beach slowly with his chin on his breast and his hands in his pockets that he made various unsuccessful attempts to smoke dried leaves and bark and wildflowers mixing with those substances shreds of his trouser pockets in order that they might have at least the flavour of tobacco and that he became more and more restive as the day wore on became more submissive in the evening paid a few apologetic attentions to cuffy at supper time and finally went to bed in a better frame of mind though still craving painfully for the weed which had enslaved him that night his dreams were still of tobacco no lover was ever assailed more violently with dreams of his absent mistress than was john jarwin with longings for his adorable pipe but there was no hope for him the beloved one was effectually and permanently gone so like a sensible man he awoke next morning with a stern resolve to submit to his fate with a good grace in pursuance of this resolution he began the day with a cold bath in which cuffy joined him then he breakfasted on chestnuts plums citrons oysters and shrimps the former of which abounded in the woods the latter on the shore jarwin cut the shrimps in a net extemporized out of his pocket handkerchief while engaged with his morning meal he was earnestly watched by several green parakeets with blue heads and crimson breasts and during pauses in the meal he observed flocks of brightly covered doves and wood pigeons besides many other kinds of birds the names of which he did not know as well as water hens plover and wild ducks lost your appetite this morning cuff said jarwin offering his companion a citron which he decidedly refused ah he continued patting the dog's sides i see how it is you've had breakfast already this morning been at it when i was asleepin for shame cuffy you should have waited for me and you've been and over at yourself again you greedy dog this was evidently the case the guilty creature forgetful of its past experiences had again gorged itself with dead fish which it had found on the beach and looked miserable well never mind doggy said jarwin finishing his meal and rising i'll give you a little exercise to-day for the good of your health we shan't go sulking as we did yesterday so come along the sailor left his bower as he spoke and set off at a round pace with his hands in his pockets and a thick stick under his arm whistling as he went while Covey followed lovingly at his heels. End of chapter 2 Recording by Esther ben Simonides Chapter 3 of Jarwin and Cuffy by R. M. Ballantyne This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther ben Simonides Chapter 3 Communings of Man and Beast it would appear to be almost an essential element in life that man should indulge in speech of course we cannot prove this seeing that we have never been cast alone on a desert island although we have been next thing to it and cannot positively conclude what would have been the consequences to our castaway if he had rigidly refrained from speech all that we can ground an opinion on is the fact that john jarwin talked as much and as earnestly to his dog as if he knew that the sagacious creature understood every word he uttered indeed he got into such a habit of doing this that it is very probable he might have come to believe that cuffy really did understand though he was not gifted with the word to reply if it be true that jarwin came to this state of credulity certain it is that cuffy was deeply to blame in the matter because the way in which that ridiculous hypocrite sat before his master and looked up in his face with his lustrous intelligent eyes and cocked his ears and wagged his tail and smiled might have deceived a much less superstitious man than a british tar we have said that cuffy smiled advisedly 
some people might object to the word and say that he only snickered or made faces that we hold is a controvertible question cuffy's facial contortions looked like smiling they came very often inappropriately and during parts of jarwin's discourse when no smile should have been called forth but if that be sufficient to prove that cuffy was not smiling then on the same ground we hold that a large proportion of those ebullitions which convulse the human countenance are not smiles but unmeaning grins be this as it may cuffy smiled snickered or grinned amazingly during the long discourses that were delivered to him by his master and indeed looked so wonderfully human in his knowingness that only required a speaking tongue and a shaved face to constitute him an unanswerable proof of the truth of the darwinian theory of the origin of the human species cuffy said jarwin panting as he reached the summit of his island and sat down on its pinnacle rock that's a splendid view ain't it to any one save a cynic or a mythanthrope cuffy replied with eye and tail it is magnificent but you're not looking at it objected jarwin you're looking straight up in my face so how can you tell what it's like doggy i see it all replied cuffy with a grin all reflected in the depths of your two loving eyes of course jarwin lost his pretty speech in consequence of its being a moot reply but he appeared to have some intuitive perception of it for he stooped down and patted the dog's head affectionately after this there was a prolonged silence during which the sailor gazed wistfully round the horizon the scene was indeed one of a surpassing beauty and grandeur the island on which he had been cast was one of those small coral gems which decked the breast of the pacific it could not have been more than nine or ten miles in circumference yet within this area there lay a miniature world the mountain top on which the seamen sat was probably eight or nine hundred feet above the level of the sea and commanded a view of the whole island on one side lie three lesser hills covered to the summits with indescribably rich verdure amongst which rose conspicuous the tall stems and graceful foliage of many coconut palms fruit trees of various kinds glittered in the sunshine and flowering shrubs in abundance lent additional splendour to the scene on the other side of the mountain a small lake glittered like a jewel among the trees and there numerous flocks of wildflowers disported themselves in peaceful security from the farther extremity of the lake flowed a rivulet which from the mountain top resembled a silver thread winding its way through miniature valleys until lost in the light yellow sand of the seashore on this beach there was not even a ripple because of the deep calm which prevailed but on the ring or coral reef which completely encircled the island those great rollers which appear never to go down even in calm fell from time to time with a long solemn roar and left an outer ring of milk-white foam the blue lagoon between the reef and the island varied from a few yards to a quarter of a mile in breadth and its quiet waters were like a sheet of glass save where they were ruffled now and then by the diving of a seagull or the fin of a shark birds of many kinds filled the grove with sweet sounds and tended largely to dispel that feeling of intense loneliness which had been creeping that day over our seaman's spirit come my doggy said jarwin patting his dumb companion's head if you and i are to dwell here for long we've got a most splendid estate to look after i only hope we don't find south sea niggers in possession before us for not hospitable cuffy they ain't hospitable being given so i'm told to prefer human flesh to most other kinds of whittles he looked anxiously round in all directions at this point as if the ideas suggested by his words were not particularly agreeable no he resumed after a short survey it don't seem as if there was any of em here anyhow i can't see none and most of the parts of the island are visible from this here masthead again the seaman became silent as he repeated his survey of the island his hands meanwhile surging slowly as if by instinct round his pockets and into their most minute recesses if haply they might find an atom of tobacco both hands and eyes however failed in their search so turning once more towards his dog jarwin sat down and addressed it thus cuff my doggy don't wink in that idiotical way you animated bundle of oakum and don't wag your tail so hard else you'll shake it off some fine day well cuff here you and i are fixed it may be for years and it may be forever as the whole song says so it behoves you and me to hold a consultation as to what's the best to be done for to make the most of your circumstances ah doggy he continued in a low tone looking pensively toward the horizon is it all that my dear wife your missus and mine cuff knows that her john has fallen heir to sitch an estate become so to speak monarch of all he surveys oh molly molly if you was only here what a paradise it would be eat and over again adam and eve without almost no difference bearing the clothes by the way for i ain't mistaken adam didn't wear his straw hat and a blue jacket with pumps and canvas ducks leastwise i've never heard that he did and i'm quite sure that eve didn't go to church on sundays and a gown with sleeves like two legs of mutton and a bonnet like a coal scuttle by the way i don't think they owned a doggy neither at this point the terrier who had gradually quieted down during the above soliloquy gave a responsive wag of its tail and looked up with a smile a plain obvious unquestionable smile which its master believed in most thoroughly ah you needn't grin like that cuff replied jarwin it's quite certain that adam and eve had no doggy 
no doubt they have plenty of wild uns them as they give names to but they hadn't a good little tame one like you cuff no nor nobody else for you're the best dog in the world if you'd only keep your spanker boom quiet but you'll shake it off you will if you go on like that there lie down and let's get on with our consultation well as i was thinking when you interrupted me what a happy life we could live here if we'd only got the old girl with us now i'd be king you know cuff and she'd be queen and we'd make you prime minister your prime favourite already you know there now if you don't clap a stopper on that ere spanker boom i'll have to lash you down while to proceed we'd build a hut or a palace of turf and sticks with a bunk alongside for you and when our clothes began to wear out we'd make pants and jackets and petticoats of coconut fibre for you must know i've often seen mats made of that stuff and splendid where there's in it too it would be rather rough for the skin at first but we get used to that in that course of time only fancies mrs jarwin in a coconut fibre petticoat with a palm leaf hat or something of that sort and after all wouldn't be half so ridiculous as some of the canvas she's used to spread on sundays jarwin evidently thought his idea somewhat ridiculous for he paused at this point and chuckled while cuffy sprang up and barked responsively while they were thus engaged a gleam of white appeared on the horizon sail ho shouted the sailor in the loud full tones with which he was wont to announce such an appearance from the masthead in days gone by oh how earnestly he strained his eyes in the direction of that little speck it might have been a sail just as likely it was the ring of a seagull or an albatross whatever it was it grew gradually less until it sank out of view on the distant horizon with it sank poor jarman's newly raised hopes still he continued to gaze intently in the hope that it might reappear but it did not with a heavy sigh the sailor rose at last winked and kept who had gone to sleep, and descended the mountain. Those lookout on the summit of the island now became the regular place of resort for Jarwin and his dumb but invaluable companion, and so absorbed did the castaway become in his contemplation of the horizon, and in his expectation of the heaving in sight of another sail, that he soon came to spend most of his time there. He barely gave himself time to cook and eat his breakfast before setting out for the spot, and frequently he remained there the live long day, having carried up enough of provision to satisfy his hunger. At first, while there, he employed himself in the erection of a rude flagstaff, and thus kept himself busy and reasonably cheerful. He caught the pole with some difficulty, his clasped knife being but a poor substitute for an axe. Then he bored a hole at the top to relieve the halyards through. These latter he easily made by plaiting together threads of coconut fibre, which were both tough and long. When ready, he set up and fixed a staff, and hoisted thereon several huge leaves of the palm tree, which in their natural size and shape formed excellent flags. When, however, all this was done, he was reduced to a state of idleness, and his mind began to dwell morbidly on the idea of being left to spend the rest of his days on the island. His converse with Cuffy became so sad that the spirits of that sagacious and sympathetic dog were visibly affected. He did indeed continue to lisp his master's hand lovingly, and to creep close to his side on all occasions, but he ceased to wag his expressive tail with the violence that used to characterize it at Penish in other days, and became less demonstrative in his conduct. All this compelled with constant exposure in all sorts of weather, while the jar was not easily affected by a breeze or a wet jacket, began at last to undermine the health of the stout seaman. He became somewhat gaunt and hollow-cheeked, and his beard and moustache, which of course he could not shave, and which for a long time presented the experience of stubble, added to the lugubriosity of his aspect. As a climax to his distress, he one day lost his dog. When it went off, or where it went to, he could not tell. On rousing up one morning, and putting out his hand almost mechanically to give it the accustomed pat of salutation, he found that it was gone a thrill of alarm passed through his frame on making this discovery and leaping up he began to shout its name but no answering bark was heard again and again he shouted but in vain though taking time he put on his coat he ran to the top of the nearest eminence and again shouted and long and long still no answer a feeling of desperate anxiety now took possession of the man the bare idea of being left in utter loneliness drove him almost distracted for some time he ran him thither and hither calling passionately to his dog until he became quite exhausted then he sat down on a rock and endeavoured to calm his spirit and consider what he should do indulging in his tendency to think aloud he said come now john don't for go to make a downright fool of yourself cuffy has only taken a longer walk than usual he'll be home to breakfast but you may as well look a bit longer there's no saying what may have happened he may have fell over a precipice or sprained his leg don't you give way to despair anyhow john jarwin but now your colours to the mast and never say die somewhat calmed by these encouraging exhortations the sailor rose up and resumed his march in a more methodical way going down to the sea he walked thence up to the edge of the bush gazing with the utmost intensity at the ground all the way in the hope of discovering cuffy's fresh footsteps but none were to be seen come said he it's clear you haven't gone to the southward or your home now we'll have a look to the northward here he was more successful the prints of cuffy's small paws were discovered on the wet sand bearing northward along the shore 
Jarwin followed them up eagerly, but coming to a place where the sand was hard and dry, and covered with thin grass, he lost them. Turning back to where they were distinct, he recommenced the search. No red Indian, in pursuit of friend or foe, ever followed up a trail with more intense eagerness than poor Jarwin followed the track of his lost companion. He even began to develop, in quite a surprising way, some of the deep sagacity of the savage, for he came before that day was over, not only to distinguish the prints of Cuffy's paws on pretty hard sand, where the impressions were very faint, but even on rough sand, where there were no distinct marks at all, only such indications as were afforded by the pressure of a dead leaf into soft ground, or the breaking of a fallen log. Nevertheless, despite his care, anxiety, and diligence, Jarwin failed to find his dog. He roamed all that day until his limbs were weary, and shouted till his voice was hoarse, but only echoes answered him. At last he sat down, overcome with fatigue and grief. It had rained heavily during the latter part of the day, and soaked him to the skin, but he heeded it not. Towards evening the weather cleared up a little, but the sun descended to the horizon in a mass of black clouds, which were guided with a strange lurid light that presaged a storm, while sea-birds flew overhead and shrieked in mild excitement, as if they were alarmed at the prospect before them. But Jarwin observed and cared for none of these things. He buried his face in his hands and sat for some time perfectly motionless. While seated thus, a cold shiver passed through his frame once or twice, and he felt unusually faint. Hump! said he the second time this occurred. Strange sort of feeling. Never felt it before. No doubt it's in consequence of going without victuals all day. Well, well, he added with a deep, long drawn sigh. Who'd have thought I'd lose he cuff in this fashion? It's foolish, no doubt, to take on like this, but I can't help it somehow. I don't believe I could feel much worse if I had lost my old woman. It's curious, but I feels also lonesome without thee, my doggie. He was interrupted by the shivering again, and was about to rise, when a long, low wail struck in his ear. He listened intently. No statue ever sat more motionless on its pedestal than did Jarwin during the next three minutes. Again the wail rose, faint and low at first, then swelling out into a prolonged loud cry, which strained to see. These seemed to be both distant and near. John Jarwin was not altogether free from superstition. His heart beat hard under the influence of a mingled feeling of hope and fear, but when he heard the cry the third time he dismissed his fears, and leaping up hurried forward in the direction whence the sound appeared to come. The bushes were thick and difficult to penetrate, but he persevered on hearing a repetition of the wail, and was thus led into a part of the island which he had not formerly visited. Presently he came to something that appeared not unlike an old track, but, although the sun had not quite set, the place was so shut in by tangled bushes and trees that he could clearly see nothing. Suddenly he put his right foot on a mass of twigs, which gave way under his weight, and he made a frantic effort to recover himself. Next moment he fell headlong into a deep hole or pit, at the bottom of which he lay stunned for some time. Recovering, he found that no bones were broken, and after considerable difficulty, succeeded in scrambling out of the hole. Just as he did so, the wheel was again raised, but it sounded so strange and so like any sound that Cuffy could produce, that he was tempted to give up the search. All the more that his recent fall had so shaken his exhausted frame that he could scarcely walk. While he stood irresolute, the wail was repeated, and this time there was a melancholy sort of bow-wow mingled with it that sent the blood careering through his veins like wildflower. Fatigue and hunger were forgotten. Shutting the name of his dog, he bounded forward, and would infallibly have plunged head foremost into another pit, at the bottom of which Cuffy lay had not that wise creature uttered a sudden bark of joy, which checked his master on the very brink. "'Hello, Cuff! Is that you, my doggie?' "'Bow, wow, wow!' exclaimed Cuffy in tones, which there could be no mistaking. Although the broken twigs and herbage which covered the mouth of the pit muffled them a good deal, and accounted for the strangeness of the creature's owls when heard at a distance. "'Why, wherever have you got yourself into?' said Jarwin, going down on his knees and groping carefully about the opening of the pit. "'I do believe you have been and gotten into a trap of some sort. The savages must have been here before us, doggy, and made more than one of them, for I've just come out of one myself. "'Hello, there! I'm into another!' he exclaimed, as the treacherous bank gave way, and he slept in headlong with a dire crash, almost smothering Cuffy in his fall. Fortunately, no damage beyond a few scratches resulted to either to man or dog, and in a few moments both stood upon firm ground.' it would be vain reader to attempt to give you in detail all that john jarwin said and did on that great occasion as he sat there on the ground caressing his dog as if it had been his own child we leave it to your imagination when he had expended the first burst of feeling he got up and was about to retrace his steps when he observed some bones lying near him on examination these proved to be the skeleton of a man at first jarwin thought it must be that of a native but he was startled to find among the dust on which the skeleton lay several brass buttons with anchors on them that he stood beside the remains of a brother seaman, who had probably been cast on the island as he himself had been, seemed very evident, and the thought filled him with strange, depressing emotions. As it was by that time too dark to make further investigations, he left the place, intending to return next day, and, going as cautiously as possible out of the wood, returned to his abode, rekindled the fire, gave Cuffy some food, and prepared some for himself. 
but before he had tasted that food another of the shivering fits seized him a strange feeling of being very ill and a peculiar wandering of his mind induced him to throw himself on his couch the prolonged strain to which body and mind had been subjected had proved too much for him and before morning he was stricken with a raging fever end of chapter three recording by esterman simonides Chapter Four of Darwin and Cuffy by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esterbin Simonides. Chapter Four: Hopes and Fears and Stern Resolves Lead to Vigorous Action. For several days the sailor lay tossing in helpless misery in his bower, without food or fire. Indeed, he could not have eaten even if food had been offered him. And as to fire, there was heat enough in his veins poor fellow to more than counterbalance the want of that during part of the time he became delirious and raved about home and sea life and old companions in a way that evidently quite alarmed cuffy for that sagacious terrier approached his master with caution and with his tail between his legs and a pitiful earnest gaze that was quite touching this was partly owing to the fact that jarwin had several times petted him with such painful violence as to astonish and render him doubtful of the affection displayed by such caresses Jarman also recurred at these times to his tobacco and beer, and apparently suffered a great deal from some dreams about those luxuries. In his ravings he often told Cuffy to fill a pipe for him, and advised him to look sharp about it, and he frequently reproached some of his old comrades for not passing the beer. Fortunately the fountain was close at hand, and he often slaked his burning thirst at it. He also thought frequently of the skeleton in the thicket, and sometimes raved with an expression of horror about being left to die alone on a desert island. By degrees, the fever reached its climax, and then it left him almost dead. For a whole day and night he lay so absolutely helpless that it cost him an effort to open his eyes, and he looked so ill that the poor dog began to whine piteously over him. But the day after that, a sensation of hunger induced him to make an effort to rouse up. He tried to raise his head. It felt as if made of lead. "'Hullo, Cuffy! Something wrong, I suspect!' It was the first time for many days that Darwin had spoken in his natural tones. The effect on the dog was instantaneous and powerful. It sprang up and wagged its expressive tail with something of the energy of former times, licked the sick man's face and hands, whined and barked intelligently, ran away in little bursts as if it had resolved to undertake a journey offhand, but came back in a few seconds, and in many other ways indicated its intense delight at finding that Darwin was himself again. But alas, Darwin was not quite himself yet and cuffy after his first ebullition sat looking in surprise at the invalid as he strove to turn on his side and reach out his heavy hand and skinny arm towards a few scraps of the last meal he had cooked before being struck down cuffy after eating the portion of that meal that suited his taste had left the remnants there as being unworthy of notice and catered for himself among the dead fish cast up on the beach although lying within a yard of his couch darwin had the greatest difficulty in reaching the food and when he did at length succeed in grasping it he fell back on his couch and lay for a long time as if dead soon however he recovered and with a feeling of gratitude such as he had never before experienced began to gnaw the hard morsels i'm in a bad way cuff he said after satisfying the first cravings of hunger cuffy gave a responsive wag with his tail and cocked his ears for more however it seems to me that i've got the turn must be thankful for that my doggy wonder how long i've been ill months mayhap don't think i could have come to be such a skeleton in a short time ha huh, that minds me of the skeleton in the world have you seen it cuff since i found you there well i must eat and drink too if i would keep the skin on my skeleton wish you had hands doggy for i'm greatly in need of help just now but you're a comfort anyhow even though you hain't got no hands i should have died without you my doggy you cheer me up do you see and when it's nigh low water with the man it don't take much to make him slip his cable the want of a kind look at this here time, Cuffy, would have sent me adrift, I do believe. It must not be supposed that all this was spoken fluently. It came slowly, by fits and starts, with a long pause at the end of each sentence, and with many a sigh between, expressive of extreme weakness. "'I wish I had a drink, Cuffy,' said the invalid, after a long pause, turning a longing look toward the spring, which welled up pleasantly close to the opening of the hut. "'Aye, that's all very well in its way.' but bow wowin and waggin your tail won't fetch me a can of water however it's a no manner o use wishin never say die here goes 
so saying he began slowly and painfully but with unyielding perseverance to push and draw and hitch himself while lying at full length towards the spring which he reached at last so exhausted that he had barely put his lips to it and swallowed a mouthful when his head dropped and he almost fainted he was within an ace of being drowned but with a violent effort he drew his face out of the spring and lay there in a half unconscious condition for some time with the clear cool water playing about his temples reviving in a little time he took another sip and then crawled back to his couch immediately he fell into a profound slumber from which cuffy strove in vain to awaken him therefore like a sagacious dog he lay down at his master's side and joined him in repose from that hour jarwin began to mend rapidly in a few days he was able to walk about with the aid of a stick in a few weeks he felt somewhat like his former self and soon after that he was able to ascend to the top of the island and resume his watch for a passing sail but the first few hours of his watch beside the old flagstaff convinced him that his hopes would in all probability be doomed to disappointment and that he would soon fall back into a state of apathy from which he might perhaps be unable to rouse himself in which case his face would certainly be that of the old sailor whose remains he had that day buried in the pit near to which they had been discovered he resolved therefore to give up watching altogether and devote all his energies in future to devising some plan of escape from the island but when he bent his mind to this task he felt a deep sinking of the heart for he had no implements wherewith to construct a boat or canoe suddenly it occurred to him for the first time in his life that he ought in this extremity to pray to god for help he was as we have said a straightforward man prompt to act as well as ready to conceive he fell on his knees at once humbly confessed his sin in depending so entirely on himself in time past and earnestly asked help and guidance for the future his prayer was not long neither was the publican's but it was effectual he arose with feelings of strong resolution and confidence which appeared to himself quite unaccountable for he had not as yet conceived any new idea or method as to escaping from the island instead of setting his mind to work as he had intended he could not help dwelling on the fact that he had never before deliberately asked help from his maker and this raised a train of self-condemnatory thoughts which occupied him the remainder of the day at night he prayed again before laying down to rest next morning he rose like a giant refreshed and after a plunge in the sea and a hearty breakfast set out with cuffy for a meditative walk great were the thoughts that swelled the seaman's broad chest during that walk and numerous as well as wild and quaint were the plans of escape which he conceived and found it necessary to abandon it's harder work to think it out than i had expected cuffy he said sitting down on a cliff that overlooked the sea and thinking aloud if you and i could only swim twenty miles or so at a stretch i'd risk it but as nothing short of that would be likely to be of service we must give it up then if i could only cut down trees with my shoe and saw planks with my jacket we might make a boat but i can't do that and we haven't no nails except our toenails which ain't the right shape or strong enough so we must give that up too it's true that we might burn a canoe out of a solid tree but who's to cut down the solid tree for us doggy i'm sure if the wagon of a tail could do it you wouldn't be long about it why on earth can't you keep still for a bit well then as we can't swim or fly and haven't a boat or canoe or the means of making them what's the next thing to be done apparently neither man nor dog could return an answer to that question for they both sat for a very long time in profound silence staring at the sea after some time jarwin suddenly exclaimed i'll do it cuffy startled by the energy with which it was said jumped up and said that's right or something very like it with his eyes yes cuffy i'll make a raft and you and i shall get on it some day with a fair wind and make for the island that we think we've seen so often on the horizon he alluded here to a faint blue line which on some unusually fine and clear days he had distinguished on the horizon to the southward and which from its always appearing on the same spot he believed to be land of some sort although it looked nothing more than a low-lying cloud so that's settled continued jarman getting up and walking smartly back to his hut with the air of a man who has a purpose in view we shall make use of the old raft as far as it'll go luckily the sail is left as you and i know cuff for it has been our blanket for many a day and when all's ready we shall go hunting you and i to have got together a stock of provisions and then up anchor and away we can only be drowned at once you know and it's better that than stopping here to die of the blues what think ye of that my doggy whatever the doggy thought of the idea there can be no question what he thought of the cheery vigorous tones of his master's voice for he gambled wildly round barked with vociferous delight and wagged his spanger-boom to such an extent 
but Jarwin warned him to have a care lest it should be carried away and go slap overboard. In pursuance of the designs thus expressed, the sailor began the construction of a raft without delay, and worked at it diligently the remainder of that day. He found, on examination, that a considerable portion of the old raft yet remained stranded on the beach, though all the smaller spars of which it had been composed had been used for firewood. With great difficulty he rolled these logs one by one into the sea, and, getting astride of each, pushed them by means of a pole towards a point of rocks, or natural jetty, alongside of which the water was deep. Here he fastened them together by means of rope, one of the old fastenings which remained to him, the others having been used in the construction of the hut. The raft thus formed was, however, much too small to weather a gale or float in a rough sea. In whatever way he placed the spars, the structure was too narrow for safety. Seeing, therefore, that it was absolutely necessary to obtain more logs, he set brain and hands to work without delay. Many years before he had seen an ancient stone hatchet in a museum, the head of which was fastened to the haft by means of a powerful thong of untanned hide. He resolved to make a hatchet of this sort. Long did he search the beach for a suitable stone, but in vain. At last he found one pretty nearly the proper shape, which he chipped and ground into the rude form of an axe. It had no eye for the handle. To have made a hole in it would have weakened the stone too much. He therefore cut a groove in the side of the handle, placed the head of the stone into it, and completed the fastening by tying it firmly with the tough, fibrous roots of a tree. It was strong and neatly made, though clumsy in appearance. But, do what he would, he could not put a sufficiently fine edge on it, and although it chipped pretty well when applied to the outside of a tree, it made very slow progress indeed as the cut deepened, and the work became so toilsome at last that he almost gave it up in despair. Suddenly it occurred to him that fire might be made use of to facilitate the work. Selecting a tall coconut tree, he ploughed dry wood all around the foot of it. Before setting it on fire, he dipped a quantity of coconut fibre in the sea, and tied a thick belt of this round the tree just above the pile, so as to protect the upper parts of the spar from the flames, as much and as long as possible. This done, he kindled the pile. A steady breeze fanned the flame into an intense fire, which ere long dried up the belt of fibre, and finally consumed it. The fire was pretty well burnt out by that time, however, so that the upper part of the stem had been effectually preserved. Removing the ashes, he was rejoiced to find that the foot of the tree had been so deeply burned that several inches of it were reduced to charcoal, which a stone hatchet readily cut away, and the operation was so successful that it only required a second fire to enable him to fell the tree. This done, he measured it off in lengths. Under each point of measurement he piled up dry wood, which consisted merely of broken branches, with belts of wet fibre on each side of these piles. Then, applying a light to the fires, he reduced the parts to charcoal, as before, and completed the work with the hatchet. Thus, in the course of a single day, he felled a tall tree and cut it up into six lengths, which he rolled down to the seat and floated off to the end of the jetty. Next day Jarwin rose with the sun and began to make twine of twisted coconut fibre, of which there was great abundance to be had everywhere. When a sufficient quantity had been made, he plaited the twine into cords, and the cords into stout ropes, which, although not so neat as regular ropes, were, nevertheless, sufficiently pliable and very strong. Several days were spent over this somewhat tedious process, and we may mention here that in all these operations the busy seaman was greatly assisted by his dog, who stuck close to him all the time, encouraging him with looks and wags of approbation. After the ropes were made, the raft was put together and firmly lashed. There was a mast and yard in the centre of it, and also a hollow, formed by the emission of a log, which was just large enough to permit of the man and his dog lying down. This hollow, slight though it was, afterwards proved of the utmost service. It is needless to recount all the details of the building and provisioning of this raft. Suffice it to say that, about three weeks after the idea of it had been conceived, it was completed and ready for sea. During his residence on the island, though it had only extended over a few months, Darwin had become very expert in the use of a sharp-pointed pole or javelin with which he had become quite an adept in spearing fish. He had also become such a dead shot with a stone that when he managed to get within thirty yards of a bird he was almost certain to hit it. Thus he was enabled to procure fish and fowl as much as he required, and as the wounds abounded with coconuts, palms, and other wild fruits, besides many edible roots, he had no lack of good fare. Now that he was about to go to sea, he bethought him of drying some of the fruits as well as curing some fish and birds. 
this he did by degrees while engaged on the raft so that when all was ready he had a store of provisions sufficient to last him several weeks in order to stow all this he removed another log from the middle of the raft and having deposited the food in the hollow carefully wrapped in coconut leaves and made into compact bundles he covered it over by laying a large layer of leaves above it and lashing a small spar on the top of them to keep them down the cask with which he had landed from the original raft and which he had preserved with great care not knowing how soon he might be in circumstances to require it served to hold fresh water on a fine morning about sunrise jarwin embarked with his little dog and made farewell to the coral island and although he had not dwelt very long there he felt to his own surprise much regret at quitting it a fresh breeze was blowing in the direction of the island or the supposed island he wished to reach this was important because in such a craft it was impossible to sail in any way except before the wind still by means of a rude oar or paddle he could modify its direction so as to steer clear of the passage through the reef and get out to sea once outside he squared the sail and ran right before the breeze of course such a weighty craft went very slowly through the water but the wind was pretty strong and to jarwin who had been for a comparatively long time unaccustomed to moving on the water the speed seemed fast enough as the island went astern and the raft lifted and fell gently on the long swell of the ocean the seaman's heart beat with a peculiar joy to which it had long been a stranger and he thanked god fervently for having so soon answered his prayer for a long time he sat reclining in the hollow of the raft resting his hand lightly on the steering oar and gazing in silence at the gradually fading woods of his late home the dog as if it were aware that a great change was being effected in their destiny lay also perfectly still and apparently contemplative at his master's feet resting his chin on a log and gazing at the receding land it was evident however that his thoughts were not absent or wandering for on the slightest motion made by his master his dark eyes turned towards him his ears slightly rose and his tail gave the faintest possible indication of an intention to wag well cuffy said jarman at last rousing himself with a sigh what are you thinking of the dog instantly rose made affectionate demonstrations and whined ah you may well say that cuff replied the man i know you ain't easy in your mind and there's some reason in that too for we're off on a rather uncertain voyage in a somewhat unseaworthy craft as ever cheer up doggy whoever turns up you and i shall sink or swim together just then the sail flapped hello cuff exclaimed jarman with a look of anxiety the wind's going to shift this was true the wind did shift and in a few minutes had veered so much round that the raft was carried away from the blue line on the horizon which jarwin had so fondly hoped would turn out to be an inhabited island it blew lightly however and when the sun went down had completely died away in these circumstances jarwin and his dog supped together and then lay down to rest full of sanguine hope they were awakened during the night by a violent squall which however did no further damage than wash a little spray over them for jarwin had taken the precaution to lower and make fast the sail he now turned his attention to preparing the raft for rough weather this consisted in simply drawing over the hollow in which he his dog and his provisions lay a piece of canvas that he had cut off the sail which was unnecessarily large it served as a tarpaulin and effectually shielded them from ordinary sprays but when the breeze freshened into a gale and green seas swept over the raft it leaked so badly that darwin's cabin became a salt-water bath and his provisions by degrees were soaked at first he did not mind this much for the air and water were sufficiently warm but after being wet for several hours he began to feel chilled as for poor cuffy his trembling body bore testimony to the state of his feelings nevertheless he did not complain being a dog of very high spirit and endurance in these circumstances the seaman hailed the rising sun with great joy even although it rose in the midst of lurid murky clouds and very soon hid its face altogether behind them as if it had made up its mind that the state of things below was so bad as to not be worth shining upon all that day and night the gale continued and they were driven before it the waves rushed so continuously and furiously over the raft that it was with the utmost difficulty jarwin could retain his position on it indeed it would have been impossible for him to have done so if he had not taken the precaution of making the hollow in the centre into which he could crouch and thus avoid the full force of the seas next day the wind abated a little but the sea still rolled mountains high in order to break their force a little he ventured to show a little corner of the sail 
small though it was, it almost carried away the slender mast, and drove the raft along at a wonderfully rapid pace. At last the gale went down, and, finally, it became a dead calm, leaving the raft like a cork heaving on the mighty swell of the Pacific Ocean. Weary and worn, almost dead with watching and exposure, John Jarwin lay down and slept, but his slumber was uneasy and unrefreshing. Sunrise awoke him, and he sat up with a feeling of deep thankfulness, as he basked once more in its warm rays, and observed that the sky above him was bright blue. But other feelings mingled with these when he gazed round on the wide waste of water, which still heaved its swelling, though now unruffled breast, as if panting after its recent burst of fury. "'Ho, oh, Cuffy, what's that? Not a sail, eh?' exclaimed Jarwin, suddenly starting up, while his languid eyes kindled with excitement. He was right! After a long, earnest, anxious gaze, he came to the conclusion that it was his sail, which shone, white and conspicuous, like a speck or a snowflake on the horizon. End of chapter 4 Recording by Esther ben Simonides. Chapter 5 of Jarwin and Cuffy by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther ben Simonides. Chapter 5 Jarwin and Cuffy Fall into Bad Company. Immediately on discovering the sail, Jarwin hoisted a small canvas flag, which he had prepared for the purpose, to the masthead, and then sat down to watch with indescribable earnestness the motions of the vessel. There was great cause for anxiety, he well knew, because his raft was a mere speck on the great waste of waters, which might easily be overlooked even by a vessel passing at a comparatively short distance, and if the vessel's course should happen to lie across that of the raft, there was every probability she would only be visible for a short time, and then pass away like a ray of hope dying out. After gazing in perfect silence for half an hour, Jarwin heaped a deep sigh and said, "'She steers this way, Cuffy.' Cuffy acknowledged the remark with a little whine and a very slight wag of his tail. It was evident that his spirits had sunk to a low ebb, and that he was not prepared to derive comfort from every trifling circumstance. "'Come, we'll have a bit of some to eat, my doggie,' said the sailor, reaching forward his hand to the provision bundle. Thoroughly understanding and appreciating this remark, Cuffy roused himself and looked on with profound interest, while his master cut up a dry fish. Having received a large share of it, he forgot everything else, and devoted all his powers, physical and mental, to the business in hand. Although Jarman also applied himself to the food with the devotion of a man whose appetite is sharp, and whose strength needs recruiting, he was very far indeed from forgetting other things. He kept his eyes the whole time on the approaching sail, and once or twice became so absorbed and so anxious, lest the vessel should change her course, that he remained with his mouth half open, and with the unconsumed morsel reposing therein for a minute or more at a time. But the vessel did not change her course. On she came, a fine large schooner with raking masts, and so trim and neat in her rig that she resembled the pleasure yet. As she drew near, Jarwin rose, and holding on to the mast, waved a piece of canvas, while Cuffy, who felt that there was now really good ground for rejoicing, wagged his tail and barked in an imbecile fashion, as if he didn't exactly know whether to laugh or cry. "'We're all safe now, doggie!' exclaimed Jarwin, as the schooner came cutting through the water before a light breeze, leaving a slight track of foam in her wake. When within about two or three hundred yards of the raft, the castaway could see that a figure leant on the vessel's side, and brought a telescope to bear on him. With a feeling of irrepressible gladness, he laughed and waved his hand. "'Ay, ay, take a good squint,' he shouted, "'and then lower a boat, eh?' He stopped abruptly, for at that moment the figure turned toward the steerman. The schooner's head fell away, presenting her stern to the raft, and began to leave her behind. The truth flashed upon Jarwin like a thunderbolt. It was clear that the commander of the strained vessel had no intention of relieving him. In the first burst of mingled despair and indignation, the seaman uttered a bass roar of defiance that might have done credit to the lungs of a small carronade, and at the same time shook his fist at the retiring schooner. The effect of this was as sudden as it was unexpected. To his surprise, he observed that the schooner's head was immediately thrown up into the wind, and all her sails shook for a few moments. Then, filling out again, the vessel bent gracefully on the other tack. With returning joy, the castaway saw her run straight towards him. In a few minutes she was alongside, and her topsails were backed. "'Look out! Catch old!' cried a gruff voice, as a sailor sent a coil of rope whirling over the raft. Jarwin caught it, took a turn around the mast, and held on. In a minute the raft was alongside. 
Weak though he was, Jarwin retained enough of his sailor-like activity to enable him to seize a rope and swing himself on board with Cuffy in his arms. He found himself on the pure white deck of a craft which was so well appointed and so well kept that his first impressions were revived, namely that she was a pleasure yacht. He knew that she was not a vessel of war, because, besides the absence of many little things that mark such a vessel, the few men on deck were not clothed like men of war's men, and there was no sign of guns, with the exception of one little brass carronade, which was probably used as a signal gun. A tall stout man, in plain costume, which was neither quite that of a seaman nor a landsman, stood with his arms crossed on his broad chest, near the man at the wheel. To him, judging him to be the captain or owner of the vessel, Jarman went up, and, pulling his forelock by way of salutation, said, "'Why, sir, I thought he was going to leave me.' "'So I was,' replied the captain dryly. "'Hold on to the raft,' he added, turning to the man who had thrown the rope to Jarwin. "'Well, sir,' said the latter in some surprise, "'in course I don't know why he was going to leave a feller creeter to his face, "'but I'm glad you didn't go for to do it, because it wouldn't have been Christian-like. "'But I'm bound for to thank you, sir, all the same for having saved me and Cuffy.' "'Don't be too free with your thanks, my good man,' returned the captain. "'For you're not saved, as you call it, yet.' "'Not saved yet?' repeated Jarwin. "'No. Whether I save you or not depends on your keeping a civil tongue in your head, and on your answers to my questions.' The captain interlarded his speech with many oaths, which, of course, we omit. This, coupled with his rude manners, induced Jarwin to suspect that the vessel was not a pleasure yet, after all, so he wisely held his peace. "'Where do you belong to?' demanded the captain. "'To Yarmouth, sir.' "'What ship did you sail in? What has come of her? And how came you to be cast adrift?' "'I sailed the Nancy, sir, from Plymouth, with a miscellaneous cargo for China. She sprung a leak in a gale, and we was obliged to make a raft, the boats being all stowed in or washed away. It was barely ready when the ship went down star and foremost. During the gale all my mates were washed off the raft or dived with exposure. Only me and my dog left.' "'How long ago was that?' asked the captain. "'Couldn't rightly say, sir. I've lost count of time. But it's more than a year gone by, anyhow.' "'That's a lie,' said the captain, with an oath. "'No taint, sir,' replied Jarwin, reddening. "'It's a truth. I was nigh starved on that raft, but was cast on an island, where I've been till a few days ago ever since, when I put out to sea on the raft that now lays astern there.' For a few seconds the captain made no rejoinder, but a glance at the raft seemed to satisfy him of the truth of what was said. At length he said abruptly, "'What's your name?' "'John Jarwin, sir.' "'Well, John Jarwin, I'll save you on one condition, which is that you become one of my crew and agree to do my bidding and ask no questions. What say you?' Jarwin hesitated. "'Hold up the raft and let this man get aboard of it,' said the captain, coolly but sternly, to the seaman who held the rope. "'You've no occasion to be so sharp, sir,' said John remonstratively. "'If you was to tell me to cut my own throat, you know, I could scarce be expected to do for that without putting a few questions as to the reason why.' "'You're a traitor, I suppose?' "'Yes, I'm a traitor,' <laughs> replied the captain. "'But I don't choose to be questioned by you. "'All you've got to do is agree to my proposal or to walk over the side. "'To tell you the truth, when I saw you first through the glass, "'you looked such a starved wretch that I thought you'd be of no use to me. "'And if it hadn't been for the yell you gave that showed there was something in you still, "'I'd have left you to sink or swim. "'So you see what sort of man you've got to deal with. "'I'm short-handed, but not so short as to engage an unwilling man, "'or a man who wouldn't be ready for any sort of dirty work.' "'You may take your choice.' "'Well, sir,' replied good Jarwin, "'I've no objection to take service with you. "'As the saying goes, beggars mustn't be choosers. "'I ain't above doing dirty work, if required.' "'John Jarwin, in the simplicity of his heart, "'imagined that the captain was in need of a man "'who could and would turn his hand to any sort of work, "'whether nautical or otherwise, on board ship or ashore, "'which was his idea of dirty work. "'But the captain appeared to understand him in a different sense, "'for he smiled in a grim fashion, nodded his head, and, turning to the seaman before mentioned, made him cut the raft adrift. The man obeyed, and in a few minutes it was out of sight astern. "'Now, Jarwin, go below,' said the captain. "'Isaacs will introduce you to your messmates.' Isaacs, who had just cut away the raft, was a short, thick-set man, with a dark, expressionless face. He went forward without saying a word, and introduced Jarwin to the men as a new hand. "'And a green on, I suppose. Give us your flipper, lad,' said one of the crew, holding out his hand. Jarwin shook it, took off his cap, and sat down, while his new friends began, as they expressed it, to pump him. Having no objection to being pumped, he had soon related the whole of his recent history. In the course of his narrative, he discovered that his new associates were an unusually rough set. Their language was interspersed with frightful oaths, and the reference to the captain showed that his power over them was certainly not founded on goodwill or affection. 
Jarwin also discovered that the freeness of his communication was not reciprocated by that of his new mates, for when he made inquiries as to the nature of the trade in which they were engaged, some of the men merely replied with uproarious laughter, chaff, or curses, while others made jocular allusions to sandalwood trading, slaving, etc. "'I shouldn't wonder now,' said one of them, "'if you was to think we were pirates.' Jarman smiled as he replied, "'Well, I don't exactly think that, but I'm bound for to say that the Skinner has got such a rakish look that it wouldn't seem unnatural, like, if you were to hoist a black flag at the peak. And you'll excuse me, shipmates, if I say that your lingo ain't just so polished as it might be.' "'And pray who are you that comes here to lecture us about our lingo?' cried one of the men fiercely, starting up and confronting Jarwin with clenched fists. "'Why, mate,' replied Jarwin, quietly folding back the cuffs of his coat, and putting himself in an attitude of defence, "'I ain't nobody in particular, not the Lord Chancellor of England, and he has still less the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm only plain Jack Jarwin, see when, but if you were any other man thinks—' "'Come, come,' cried one of the men, in a tone of authority, striding forward and thrusting Jarwin's assailant violently aside. "'None of that sort of thing here. Keep your fist for the niggers, Bill. We're all brothers here, you know. An affectionate family, so to speak.' There was a general laugh at this. Bill retired sulkily, and Jarwin sat down to a plate of hot lobscouse, which proved to be very good, and of which he stood much in need. For several days our hero was left very much to himself. The scooter sped on her voyage with a fair wind, and the men were employed in light work, or idled about the ship deck. No one interfered with Jarwin, but at the same time no one became communicative. The captain was a very silent man, and it was evident that the crew stood much in awe of him. Of course Jarwin's suspicions as to the nature of the craft were increased by all this, and from some remarks which he overheard two or three days after his coming on board, he felt convinced that he had fallen into bad company. Before a week had passed, this became so evident that he made up his mind to leave the vessel at the very first opportunity. One day he went boldly to the captain, and demanded to know the nature of the trade in which the schooner was employed and their present destination. He was told that this was no business of his, and that he had better go forward and mind his duty without more ado else he should be pitched overboard. The captain used such forcible language when he said this, and seemed so thoroughly in earnest, that Darwin felt no longer any doubt as to his true character. "'I'll tell you what it is, my lad,' said the captain. "'My schooner is a traitor or man of war according to circumstances, and I'm a free man, going where I choose and doing what I please. I treat my men well when they do their duty. When they don't, I make them walk the plank. No doubt you know what that means. If you don't, we shall soon teach you. Take tonight to think it over.' "'Tomorrow morning I'll have a question or two to ask you. "'There. Go.' "'Jarwin bowed submissively and retired. "'That night the moon shone full and clear on the wide ocean's breast, "'and Jarwin stood at the bow of the schooner, "'looking sadly over the side and patting his little dog gently on the head. "'Coffee, you and me's in a fix, I suspect,' he murmured in a low tone. "'But cheer up, doggy. A way to escape will not turn up, no doubt.' "'He had scarcely uttered the words when his eyes fell on the distant outline of land on the lee bow.' He started and gazed with fixed intensity for some minutes, under the impression that it might perhaps be a fog bank lighted by the moon. But in a short time it became so distinct that there could be no doubt that it was land. He pointed it out to the watch on deck, one of whom said carelessly that he had seen it for some time, and that there were plenty more islands of the same sort in these seas. Jarman walked aft and stood near the lee gangway, contemplating the island in silence for some time. A small oar lay at his feet. Suddenly he conceived the idea of seizing this, plunging overboard and attempting to swim to land. He was a splendid swimmer, and although the island appeared to be more than two miles distant, he did not fear failure. A moment's reflection, however, convinced him that the men on deck would certainly hear the plunge, heave the ship to and lower a boat, in which case he should be immediately overtaken. Still, being resolved to escape at all hazards, he determined to make the venture. Fastening a rope to a belaying pen, he tied the oar to it and lowered it over the side until it trailed in the water. He then lifted Cuffy, who was almost always near him, onto the side of the vessel, with a whisper to keep still. The watch paced the weather side of the deck, conversing in low tones. The steersman could, from his position, see both gangways, and although the light was not strong enough to reveal what Jaron was about, it was too strong to admit of his going bodily over the side without being observed. He therefore walked slowly to the head of the vessel, where he threw over the end of a small rope. By means of this, when the watch were well aft, he slid noiselessly into the sea, hanging on by one hand, and supporting Cuffy with the other. Once fairly in the water, he let go. The side of the vessel rubbed swiftly past him, and he all but missed grasping the oar which trailed the gangway. By this he held on for a few seconds to untie the rope. He had just succeeded and was about to let go when, unfortunately, the handle of the oar chanced to hit the end of Cuffy's nose a severe blow. The poor dog, therefore, gave vent to a loud yell of pain. 
Instantly, Jarwin allowed himself to sink and held his breath as long as he possibly could, while Cuffy whined and swam on the surface. Meanwhile, the men on deck ran to the side. Hello! cried one. It's Jarwin's little dog gone overboard. Let it go! cried another with a laugh. It's a useless brute and needs a power grub. Oh, I say, what a plashin' it do kick up, he added, as the little dog that was left astern, making vain attempts to clamber on the oar. Well, lads, there's something else floating beside it, uncommon like a seal. Are you sure, Bill, that John hasn't gone overboard along with his dog? Why, no, replied Bill. I seed him go forward a little ago. Besides, it ain't likely he'd go without giving a shout. I don't know that, said the other. He might have hit his head against something and tumbled over. By this time, the objects in question were almost out of sight astern. In a few minutes more, a dark cloud covered the moon, and effectually shut them out from view. Just then the captain came on deck and asked what was wrong. "'Fools!' he exclaimed in a voice of thunder, on being told. "'Lower the gig! Look sharp! Don't you see the land, you idiots? The man's his way as well as the dog!' In a few seconds the topsails were backed, and the boat lowered, manned, and pushed off. But Jarwin heard and saw nothing of all this. He was now far astern for the vessel had been going rapidly through the water. On coming to the surface after his dive, he caught hold of Cuffy, and, with a cheering word or two, placed him on his back, telling him to hold on by his paws the best way he could. Then, grasping the end of the oar and pointing the blade landwards, he struck out vigorously with his legs. It was a long and weary swim, but as his life depended on it, the seaman persevered. When he felt his strength giving way, he raised not only his heart but his voice in prayer to God, and felt restored each time that he did so. Just as he neared shore, the sound of oars broke on his ears, and presently he heard the well-known voice of the captain ordering the men to pull hard. Fortunately, it was by this time very dark. He landed without being discerned. The surf was heavy, but he was expert in rough water, went in on the top of a billow, and was safely launched on a soft, sandy beach, almost at the same moment with the boat. The latter was, however, at a considerable distance from him. He crept cautiously up the shore until he gained a thicket, and then, rising, he plunged into the woods and ran straight before him until he was exhausted, carrying the little dog in his arms. Many a fallen bruise did the poor fellow receive in his progress, but the fear of being retaken by the pirates, for such he felt convinced they were, lent him wings. The captain and his men made a long search, but finally gave it up, and, returning to the boat, pushed off. Jarwin never saw them again. He and Cuffy lay where they had fallen, and slept, wet though they were, till the sun was high. They were still sleeping when a native chief of the island, happening to pass along the beach, discerned Jarwin's footsteps and traced him out. This chief was an immensely large, powerful man, armed with a heavy club. He awoke the sailor with a kick, and spoke in a language which he did not understand. His gestures, however, said plainly enough, "'Get up and come along with me.' So Jarwin thought it best to obey. Of course, whatever Jarwin thought, Cuffy was of precisely the same opinion. They therefore quietly got up and followed the big chief to his village, where they were received by a large concourse of savages with much excitement and curiosity. End of chapter 5 Recording by Esther Minsamonides Chapter 6 of Jarwin and Cuffy by R. M. Ballantyne This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Minsamonides Chapter 6. Our Hero Becomes a Favorite and Entertains Hopes of Escape The sufferings which Jarwin with his little dog had hitherto undergone were as nothing compared to those which he endured for some months after being taken prisoner by the savages. At first he gave himself up for lost, feeling assured that ere long he would be sacrificed in the temple of one of their idols, and then baked in an oven and consumed as food, according to the horrible practice of the South Sea Islanders. Indeed, he began to be much astonished that, as day after day passed, there was no sign of any intention to treat him in this way, although several times the natives took him out of the hut in which he was imprisoned, and, placing him in the centre of a circle, held excited and somewhat angry discussions over him. It was not till months afterward, when he had acquired a slight knowledge of their language, that he began to understand why he was spared at this time. It appeared that four shipwrecked sailors, who had been cast on a neighbouring island, had been killed, baked, and eaten, according to usage, by the chief and his friends. Immediately afterwards, those who had partaken of this dreadful food had been seized with severe illness, and one or two had died. This fact had been known for some time to Jarwin's captors, and the discussions above referred to had been engaged with reference to the question whether it was likely that the flesh of the white men who had been thrown on their island would be likely to disagree with their stomachs. It was agreed that this was very probable, 
and thus the seaman's life was spared but he was sometimes tempted to wish that his had not been spared for his master the big chief was a very hard man and he put him to the most toilsome labor and treated him with every sort of indignity moreover he was compelled to be a witness of practices so revolting and cruel that he often put the question to himself whether it was possible for devils to display greater wickedness and depravity than these people jarwin was frequently tempted to resent the treatment he had received but fortunately he was prudent enough to bear it submissively for it is certain that if he had rebelled he would have been slain on the spot moreover he set himself to carry out his favourite maxim namely that it was wise in all circumstances to make the best of everything he laboured therefore with such good will that he softened the breast of the big chief who gradually became more amiable and even indulgent to him thus he came to know experimentally the wisdom of that scripture be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good john jarman possessed a remarkably fine sonorous bass voice which in former days had been a source of great delight to his messmates although strong and deep it was very sweet and tender in its tones and eminently suited for pathetic and sentimental songs indeed jarman's nature was so earnest that although he had a great deal of quiet humour about him and could enjoy comic songs very much he never himself sang anything humorous now it chanced that the big chief had a good ear for music and soon became so fond of the songs which his slave was wont to hum when at work that it used to make him sit down beside him frequently and sing for hours at a time fortunately jarwin's lungs were powerful and his voice being full toned and loud he was able to sing as much as his master desired without much exertion he gave him his whole budget which was pretty extensive including melodies of the black-eyed susan and ben bolt stamp when these had been sung over and over again he took to the psalms and paraphrases many of which he knew by heart and finally he had recourse to extempore composition which he found much easier than he had expected the tones flowing naturally and the words being gibberish thus he became sort of david to this remarkable saul by degrees as he learnt the native tongue he held long conversations with the big chief and told him about his own land and countrymen and religion in regard to the last the chief was very inquisitive and informed his slave that white men had been for some time in that region trying to teach the religion to the men of an island which though invisible from his island was not very far distant jarwin said little about this but from that time he began to hope that through the missionaries he might be able to make his escape ere long during all this time poor cuffy experienced a variety of vicissitudes and made several narrow escapes at first he had been caught and was on the point of being killed and roasted when he wriggled out of his captor's grasp and made off to the mountains terror-struck here he dwelt for some weeks in profound melancholy being unable to stand separation from his master any longer he ventured to return to the village but was immediately hunted out of it and once again fled in horror to the hills jarwin was not allowed to quit the village alone he therefore never saw his little dog and at length came to the conclusion that it had been killed when however he had ingratiated himself with his master he was allowed more freedom and one day having wandered a considerable distance into the mountains he came suddenly and unexpectedly upon cuffy having experienced nothing from man of late but the most violent and cruel treatment cuffy no sooner beheld as he supposed one of its enemies than without giving him a second glance he sprang up put his ears back his tail between his legs and uttering a terrible yell fled on the wings of terror but jarwin put two fingers in his mouth and gave a peculiar shrill whistle which brought the dog to a sudden stop he looked back with ears cocked again jarwin whistled instantly cuffy turned and ran at him with a series of mingled yells whines and barks that gave but a faint idea of his tumultuous feelings it would scarcely be too much to say that he almost ate his master up he became like an india rubber ball gone mad he bounded round him to such an extent that jarwin found it very difficult to get hold of or pat him it is impossible to do justice to such a meeting we draw a veil over it only remarking that the sailor took his old favourite back to the village and after much entreaty and a good deal of persuasive song was permitted to keep him about ten months after this event war broke out between the big chief and a neighbouring tribe of natives who were a very quarrelsome and vindictive set the tribe with whom jarwin dwelt would gladly have lived in peace but the other tribe was stronger in numbers and thirsted for conquest a consequence of strength which is by no means confined to savages when war was formally declared the big chief told jarwin to prepare himself for battle at first our hero had some qualms of conscience about it but on reflecting that on the part of the tribe to which he belonged it was a war of self-defence his conscience was pacified the big chief ordered him to throw away his now ragged garments smear his whole body over with oil and red earth 
faint black spots upon his cheeks and a white streak down his nose, and put on warrior's costume. In vain Jarwin begged and protested and sang. The big chief's blood was up, and his commands must be obeyed. Therefore Jarwin did as he was bid, went out to battle in this remarkable costume, if we may so style it, and proved himself such a prodigy of valor that his prowess went far to turn the tide of victory wherever he appeared during the fight. But we pass over all this. Suffice it to say that the Pugnaces tribe was severely chastised and reduced to a state of quiet, for the time at least. One day, not long after the cessation of war, a canoe arrived with several natives, all of whom wore clothing of a much more civilized description than is usually seen among South Sea natives. They had a long, earnest talk with the savages, but Jarwin was not allowed to hear it, or to show himself. Next day they went away. For some time after that, Big Chief was very thoughtful, but silent, and Jarwin could not induce him to become confidential until he had sung all his melodies and all his psalms several times over, and indulged in extempore melody and gibberish until his vein and throat were alike exhausted. The Big Chief gave way at last, however, and told him that his late visitors were Christians, who, with two native teachers, had been sent from a distant island by a white chief named Williams to try and persuade him and his people to burn their idols. "'And are you going to do it?' asked Darwin. "'No,' replied the chief, "'but I am going to Raratonga to see Cookie Williams.' Of course they conversed in the native tongue, but as this would be unintelligible to the reader, we translate. It may also be remarked here that Cookie signified a white man, and is a word derived from the visit of the great navigator Captain Cook to these islands, but the natives of which he was ultimately murdered. Durban had heard, while in England, of the missionary Williams. On learning that he was among the islands, his heart beat high, and he begged earnestly that he might be allowed to go with the chief and his party to Rarotonga, but his wily master would not consent. "'You will run away,' he said. "'No, I won't,' said Darwin earnestly. "'Big Chief shook his head. "'They will take you from me,' he said, "'when they find out who you are.' "'I'll not let em, replied Jarwin, "'with pathetic sincerity, "'and then began to sing in such a touching strain "'that his master lay back on his couch "'and rolled his large eyes in rapture. "'You shall go, Jarwin. "'That was the best he could make of the name. "'If you will make me a promise.' "'Name it, old boy,' said Jarwin. "'that you will go dressed like one of my young men, "'and never open your lips to speak a word, "'no more than if you were dumb, "'whether the cookies speak to you or not.' "'Jarwin hesitated, "'but reflecting that there was no chance "'of his seeing the missionary at all "'if he did not give this promise, he consented. "'A week after that, all the preparations were made, "'and four large canoes, full of well-armed men, "'set out for Rarotonga. "'At the time we write of, "'the island of Rarotonga had been recently discovered "'by the missionary Williams.' The success of the labors of that devoted man and his native teachers is one of the marvelous chapters in the history of the Isles of the Pacific. At Rarotonga, God seemed to have prepared the way for the introduction of the gospel in a wonderful manner. For although the native teachers who first went ashore there were roughly handled, they were enabled, nevertheless, to persevere, and in not much more than a year, the gospel wrought a change in the feelings and habits of the people, which was little sort of miraculous. Within that brief period, they had given up and burnt all their idols, had ceased to practice their bloody and horrible rites, and had embraced Christianity, giving full proof of their sincerity by submitting to a code of laws founded on Scripture, by agreeing to abandon polygamy, by building a large place of worship, and by leading comparatively virtuous and peaceful lives. All this was begun and carried on for a considerable time, not by the European missionaries, but by two of the devoted native teachers, who had previously embraced Christianity. The extent of the change thus wrought in the Raritongans in so short a time by the gospel may be estimated by a glance at the difficulties with which the missionaries had to contend. In writing of the ancient usages of the people, Mr. Williams, see Williams' most interesting work, entitled A Narrative of Missionary Enterprises in the South Sea Islands, tells us that one of their customs was an unnatural practice called Kukumi Anga, as soon as a son reached manhood, he would fight and wrestle with his father for the mastery, and if he obtained it, would take forcible possession of the farm belonging to his parent, whom he drove in a state of destitution from his home. Another custom was equally unnatural and inhuman. When a woman lost her husband, the relatives of the latter, instead of paying visits of kindness to the fatherless and widow in their affliction, would seize every article of value belonging to the deceased, turn the disconsolate mother and her children away, and possess themselves of the house, food, and land. But they had another custom, which caused still greater difficulties to their missionaries. It was called land-eating, in other words, the getting possession of each other's lands unjustly, and these, once obtained, were held to the greatest possible tenacity. 
for land was exceedingly valuable at Rarotonga, and on no subject were the contentions of the more people more frequent or fierce. From this it will be seen that the Rarotongans were apparently a most unpromising soil in which to plant the good seed, for there is scarcely another race of people on earth so depraved and unnatural as they seem to have been. Nevertheless, God's blessed word overcame these deep-rooted prejudices, and put an end to these and many other horrible practices in little more than a year. After this glorious work had been accomplished, the energetic missionary, who ultimately laid down his life in one of these islands, the island of Aramanga, for the sake of Jesus Christ, resolved to go himself in search of other islands in which to plant the gospel, and to send out native teachers with the same end in view. The record of their labors reads more like a romance than a reality, but we cannot afford to diverge longer from the course of our narrative. It was one of these searching parties of native teachers that had visited the big chief's island, as already described, and it was their glowing words and representations that had induced him to undertake this voyage to Rarotonga. Big Chief, of course, occupied the largest of the four canoes, and our friend Darwin sat on a seat in front of him, painted and decorated like a native warrior, and wielding a paddle like the rest. Of course, Cuffy had been left behind. Poor Darwin had, during his captivity, undergone the process of being tattooed from head to foot. It had taken several months to accomplish, and had cost him inexpressible torture, owing to the innumerable punctures made by the comb-like instrument with which it was done on the inflamed muscles of his body. By dint of earnest entreaty and much song, he had prevailed on Big Chief to lay his hands and face untouched. It is doubtful if he would have exceeded in this, despite the witching power of his melodious voice, had he not at the same time offered to paint his own face in imitation of chewing, and accomplish the feat to such perfection that his delighted master insisted on having his own painted forthwith in the same style. During a pause in their progress, while the paddlers were resting, Big Chief made his captive sit near him. You tell me that cookie men, by which he meant white men, never lie, never deceive. I should lie and deceive myself if I said so, replied Jarwin bluntly. What did you tell me then? asked the chief with a frown. I told you that Christian men don't lie or deceive, leastwise they don't do it with a will. Are you a Christian man, Jowin? I am, replied the sailor promptly, then with a somewhat perplexed air. Anyhow, I hope I am, and I try to act as such. Good. I will soon prove it. You will be near the cookie men of Raratonga tomorrow. You will have chance to go with them and leave me. But if you do, or if you speak one word of cookie tongue, you are not Christian. Moreover, I will batter your skull with my club, till it is like the soft pulp of the breadfruit. You're a cute feller, as the Yankees say, remarked Jarwin with a slight smile. This being said in English, the chief took no notice of it, but glanced at his slave suspiciously. "'Big chief,' said Jarwin, after a short silence, "'even before I was a Christian, I had been taught by my mother to be ashamed of telling a lie, so you have no occasion for it to doubt me. But it's a hard thing to stand by a countryman, especially in my peculiar circumstances, and not let him know that you can speak to him. May I not be allowed to palaver a bit with him? I won't ask him to take me from you.' "'No,' said the chief sternly. You came with me promising that you would not even speak to the cookie men. Well, Big Chief, replied Darwin energetically, you shall see that a British seaman can stick to his promise. I'll be true to you, honor bright. I'll not give him a word of the English lingo if they was to try to tear it out of me with word hot pincers. I'll content myself with looking at him and listening to him. It'll be a comfort to hear my mother tongue, anyhow. Good, replied the Chief. I trust you. The interval of rest coming to an end at this point, the conversation ceased, and the paddles were resumed. It was a magnificent day. The great Pacific was in that condition of perfect repose which its name suggests. Not a breath of air ruffled the wide sheet of water, which lay spread out like a vast circular-looking glass, to reflect the sky, and it did reflect the sky with such perfect fidelity that the clouds and cloudlets in the deep were exact counterparts of those that floated in the air, while the four canoes, resting on their own reflections, seemed to be suspended in the centre of a crystal world which was dazzlingly lit up by two resplendent suns. This condition of calm blasted the whole of that day and night, and the heat was very great. Nevertheless, the warriors, of whom there were forty to fifty in each canoe, did not cease to paddle for an instant, save when the short spells of rest came round, and when, twice during the day, they stopped to eat a hasty meal. When the sun set, they still continued to paddle onwards, the only difference being that, instead of passing over a sea of crystal, 
they appear to traverse an ocean of amber and burnished gold all night they continued their labors about daybreak the chief permitted them to enjoy a somewhat longer period of rest during which most of them without lying down indulged in a short but refreshing nap resuming the paddle they proceeded until sunrise when their hearts were gladdened by the sight of the blue hills of rarotonga on the bright horizon now we shall soon be at the end of our voyage said the chief as he pointed to the distant hills and glanced at jarwin as he might at a prize which he was much afraid of losing remember the promise you christian don't be a deceiver you british tar he quoted jarwin here honour bright replied our hero the savage gazed earnestly into the sailor's bright eyes and appeared to think that if his honour was as bright as they were there was not much cause to fear at all events he looked pleased nodded his head and said good with considerable emphasis by this time the hills of rarotonga were beginning to look less like blue clouds and more like real mountains gradually as the canoes drew nearer the markings on them became more and more defined till at last everything was distinctly visible rocky eminences and luxuriant valleys through which flowed streams and rivulets that glittered brightly in the light of the ascending sun and almost constrained jarwin to shout with delight for he gazed upon a scene more lovely by far than anything he had yet beheld in the southern seas End of chapter six recording by Esther and Simonides Chapter seven of Darwin and Cuffy by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther and Simonides. Chapter seven. Our hero is exposed to stirring influences and trying circumstances. When the four canoes drew near to the island, immense numbers of natives were seen to assemble on the beach, so that Big Chief deemed it advisable to advance with great caution. Presently a solitary figure, either dressed or painted black, advanced in front of the others and waved a white flag. This seemed to increase the chief's anxiety, for he ordered the men to cease paddling. Jarwin, whose heart had leaped with delight when he saw the dark figure and the white flag, immediately turned round and said, you needn't be afraid old boy that's the missionary i'll be bound in his black toggery and a white flag means peace among cookie men on hearing this the chief gave the order to advance and darwin seizing a piece of native cloth that lay near him waved it round his head stop that you british tar growled big chief seizing a huge club which bristled with shark's teeth and shaking it at the seaman while his own teeth were displayed in a threatening grin all right old codger replied the british tar with a submissive look honour bright honour bright he added several times in a low tone as if to keep himself displayed in a threatening grin we have already said that our hero and his master talked in the native tongue which the former had acquired with wonderful facility but such familiar expressions as old boy old codger etc were necessarily uttered in english fortunately for jarwin who was by nature free and easy the savage chief imagined these to be terms of respect and was consequently rather pleased to hear him similarly big chief said british tar and christian in english as he had learned them from his captive when master and slave began to grow fond of each other as we have seen that they soon did their manly natures being congenial they used these expressions more frequently darwin meaning to express facetious good will but his master desiring to express kindly regard except when he was roused to anger in which case he did not however use them contemptuously but as expressive of earnest solemnity on landing big chief and his warriors were received by the reverend mr williams and his native teachers of whom there were two men and two women with every demonstration of kindness and were informed that the island of Veratonga had cast away and burned its idols and now worshipped the true god who had sent his son jesus christ to save the world from sin i know that replied big chief to the teacher who interpreted convert like yourself came to my island not long ago and told me all about it now i have come to see and hear a wise man will know and understand before he acts big chief was then conducted to the presence of the king of that part of the island who stood surrounded by his chief men under a grove of tamanu trees the king whose name was Micaiah was a handsome man in the prime of life about six feet high and very massive and muscular he had a noble appearance and commanding aspect and though not so tall as big chief was obviously a man of superior power in every way 
His complexion was light, and his body most beautifully tattooed and slightly coloured, with a preparation of turmeric and ginger, which gave it a light orange tinge, and, in the estimation of the Rarotongans, added much beauty to his appearance. The two chiefs advanced frankly to each other, and amiably rubbed noses together, the South Sea method of salutation. Then a long palaver ensued, in which Big Chief explained the object of his visit, namely, to hear about the new religion, and to witness its effects with his own eyes. The missionary gladly gave him a full account of all he desired to know, and earnestly urged him to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to throw away his idols. Big Chief and his men listened with earnest attention and intense gravity, and after the plower was over, retired to consult together in private. During all this time poor Jarwin's heart had been greatly stored. Being tattooed and nearly naked, as well as painted like the rest of his comrades, of course no one took particular notice of him, which depressed him greatly, for he felt an intense desire to seize the missionary by the hand and claim him as a countryman. Indeed, this feeling was so strong upon him on first hearing Mr. Williams' English tone of voice, although the missionary spoke only in the native tongue, that he could scarcely restrain himself and had to mutter, Honor bright, several times, in order, as it were, to hold himself in check. Honor bright became his moral reign, or curb, on that trying occasion. But when, in the course of palaver, Mrs. Williams, who had accompanied her husband on this dangerous expedition, came forward and addressed a few words to the missionary in English, he involuntarily sprang forth with an exclamation of delight in once more hearing the familiar tongue. He glanced over at Big Chief and checked himself. There was a stern expression on the bow of the savage, but his eyes remained fixed on the ground, and his form and face were immovable, as though he heard and saw nothing. "'Honor bright!' whispered Jarwin, as he turned about and retired among his comrades. Fortunately, his sudden action had only attracted the attention of a few of those who were nearest to him, and no notice was taken of it. When Big Chief retired with his men for consultation, he called Jarwin aside. Jarwin, he said, with unusual gravity, you must not hear a palaver. Why not, old feller? It is your business to obey, not to question, replied Big Chief sternly. Go. When I want you, I will find you. You may go and look at the cookie missionary, but remember, I have your promise. Honor bright, replied Jarwin with a sigh. The promise of a British tar? Surely, replied Jarwin. Of a Christian? asked Big Chief with emphasis. Aye, that's the idea, but it's a hard case, old boy, to advise a poor fellow to go into the very jaws of temptation. I would rather he had ordered me to keep away from him. However, here goes. Muttering these words to himself, he left his savage friends to hold their palaver, and went straight into the jaws of temptation, by walking towards the cottage of the missionary. It was a neat wooden erection, built and plastered by the natives. Jarwin hung about the door, sometimes he even ventured to peep in at the windows, in his intense desire to see and hear the long-lost forms and tones of his native land, and, as the natives generally were much addicted to such indications of curiosity, his doing so attracted no unusual attention. While he was standing near the door, Mrs. Williams unexpectedly came out. Jarwin, feeling ashamed to appear in so very light a costume before a lady, turned smartly round and walked away. Then, reflecting that he was quite as decently clothed as the other natives about, he turned again and slowly retraced his steps, pretending to be interested in picking stones and plants from the ground. The missionary's wife looked at him for a moment with no greater interest than she would have bestowed on any other native and then gazed towards the seashore, as if she expected somebody. Presently Mr. Williams approached. "'Well, have you been successful?' she asked. "'Yes, it has all been arranged satisfactorily, so I shall begin at once,' replied Mr. Williams. "'The only thing that gives me anxiety is the bellows.' Poor Jarwin drew nearer and nearer. His heart was again stirred in a way that it had not been for many a day, and he had to pull the rein pretty tightly. In fact, it required all his Christianity and his British tarhood to prevent him from revealing himself and claiming protection at that moment. As he raised himself and gazed with intense interest at the speakers, the missionary's attention became fixed on him, and he beckoned him to approach. "'I think that you are one of the strangers who have just arrived, are you not?' This was spoken in the language of Veratonga, 
which was so similar to that which he had already acquired, that he opened his mouth to reply, "'Yes, Your Honour,' or "'Your Reverence,' in English. But it suddenly occurred to him that he must translate this into the native tongue, if his secret was to be preserved. While he was turning over in his mind the best words to use for this purpose, he reflected that the imperfection of his knowledge, even the mere tone of his voice, would probably betray him. He had therefore remained dumb, with his mouth open. The missionary smiled slightly, and repeated his question. Darwin, in great perplexity, still remained dumb. Suddenly an idea flashed across his mind. He pointed to his mouth, wagged his tongue, and shook his head. "'Ah, oh, you are dumb, my poor man,' said the missionary, with a look of pity. "'Or tabooed,' suggested the lady. "'His tongue may have been tabooed.' There was some reason and probability in this, for the extraordinary custom of tabooing, by which various things are supposed to be rendered sacred, and therefore not to be used or touched, is extended by the South Sea Islanders to various parts of their bodies, as, for instance, the hands, in which case the person so tabooed must, for a time, be fed by others, as he dare not use his hands. Darwin, being aware of the custom, was so tickled by the idea of his tongue being tabooed, that he burst into an uncontrollable fit of laughter to the intense amazement of his questioners. While in the midst of his laugh, he became horrified by the thought that that of itself would be sufficient to betray him. So he cleverly remedied the evil and gave vent to his feelings by tapering the laugh off into a hideous yell and rushed frantically from the spot. Strange, observed the missionary, gazing after the fugitive mariner. How like that was to an English laugh. "'More like the cry of a South Sea maniac, I think,' said Mrs. Williams, re-entering the house, followed by her husband. The matter which the missionary said had been arranged so satisfactorily, and was begun at once, was neither more nor less than the building of a ship, in which to traverse the great island-studded breast of the Pacific. In case someone, accustomed to think of the ponderous vessels which are built constantly in this land, with such speed and facility, should be inclined to regard the building of a ship a small matter, we shall point out a few of the difficulties with which the missionary had to contend in his projected work. In the first place, he was on what is sometimes styled a savage island, an island that lay far out of the usual track of ships, that had only been discovered a little more than a year at that time, and was inhabited by a bloodthirsty, savage, cruel, and ignorant race of human beings, who had renounced idolatry and embraced Christianity only a few months before. They knew more of shipbuilding than the celebrated man in the moon, and their methods of building canoes were quite inapplicable to vessels of large capacity. Besides this, Mr. Williams was the only white man on the island, and he had no suitable implements for shipbuilding, except axes and augers, and a few of the smaller of the carpenter's tools. In the building of a vessel, timbers and planks are indispensable, but he had no pit saw wherewith to cut these. It is necessary to fasten planks and timbers together, but he had no nails to do this. Heavy iron forgings were required for some parts of the structure, but, although he possessed iron, he had no smith's anvil, or hammer, or tongs, or bellows wherewith to forge it. In these circumstances he commenced one of the greatest pieces of work ever undertaken by man, greatest not only because of the mechanical difficulties overcome, but because of the influence for good that the ship, when completed, had upon the natives of the southern seas, as well as its reflex influence in exciting admiration, emulation, and enthusiasm in other lands. The first difficulty was the bellows. Nothing could be done without these in the forge. There were four goats on the island. Three of these were sacrificed, their skins were cut up, and, along with two boards, converted into a pair of smith's bellows in four days. No one can imagine the intense interest with which John Jarwin looked on, while the persevering but inexperienced missionary laboured at this work and tremendous was the struggle which he had to keep his hands idle and his tongue quiet for he was a mechanical genius and could have given the missionary many a useful hint but did not dare to do so lest his knowledge or voice or aptitude for such work or all these put together should betray him he was therefore fain to content himself with looking on or performing a few trifling acts in the way of lifting carrying and hewing with the axe his friends frequently came to look on as the work progressed and he could not help fancying that they regarded him with looks of peculiar interest. This perplexed him, but, supposing that it must result from suspicion of his integrity, he took no notice of it, save that he became more resolute than ever, in reference to honour bright. 
Big Chief also came to look on and wonder, but, although he kept a sharp eye on his slave, he did not seem to desire intercourse with him. When the bellows were finished, it was felt that they did not work properly. The upper box did not fill well, and, when tried, they were not satisfied with blowing wind out, but insisted on drying fire in. They were, in short, a failure. Deep were the ponderings of the missionary as to how this was to be remedied, and small was the light thrown on the subject by the various encyclopedias and other books which he possessed. But the question was somewhat abruptly settled for him by the rats. These creatures devoured all the leather of the bellows in a single night, and left nothing but the bare boards. Rats were an absolute plague at that time in Rarotonga. Mr. William tells us, in his interesting narrative, that he and his family never sat down to a meal without having two or more persons stationed to keep them off the table. While kneeling at family prayer, they would run over them in all directions, and it was found difficult to keep them out of the beds. On one occasion, when the servant was making one of the beds, she uttered a scream, and on rushing into the room, Mr. Williams found that four rats had crept under the pillow and made themselves snug there. They paid for their impudence, however, with their lives. On another occasion, a pair of English shoes, which would not be put in the usual place of safety, were totally devoured in a night, and the same fate befell the covering of a hair trunk. No wonder, then, that they did not spray the bellows. Poor Jarwin sorrowed over this loss fully as much as did the missionary, but he was forced to conceal his grief. Still bent on discovering some method of raising the wind, Mr. Williams appealed to his inventive powers. He considered that if a pump threw water, there was no reason why it should not throw wind. Impressed with this belief, he set to work and made a box about eighteen or twenty inches square and four feet high with a valve in the bottom to let air in, a hole in the front to let it out, and a sort of piston to force it through the hole. By means of a long lever, the piston could be raised, and by heavy weights it was pushed down. Of course considerable power was required to raise the piston and its weights, but there was a superabundance of power, for thousands of wandering natives were ready and eager to do what they were bid. They could have bumped the billows at had they been in the size of a house. They worked admirably in some respects, but had the same fault as the first pair, namely, a tendency to suck in the fire. This, however, was corrected by a means of a valve at the back of the pipe which communicated with the fire. Another fault lay in the length of interval between the blasts. This was remedied by making another box of the same kind, and working the two alternately, so that when one was blowing the fire, the other was, as it were, taking breath. Thus a continuous blast was obtained, while eight or ten grinning and delighted natives worked the levers. The great difficulty being thus overcome, the work progressed rapidly. A large hard stone served for an anvil, and a small stone perforated with a handle affixed to it. The duty for a hammer. A pair of carpenter's pincers served for tongs, and charcoal, made from the coconut and other trees, the duty for coals. In order to obtain planks, the missionary split trees in half with wedges, and then the natives thinned them down with adzes extemporized by fitting crooked handles to ordinary hatchets. When a bend or twisted plank was required, having no apparatus for steaming it, he bent a piece of bamboo to the required shape and sent natives to scour the woods in search of a suitable crooked tree. Thus planks suited to his purpose were obtained. Instead of fastening the planks to the timbers of the ship with iron nails, large wooden pins or tree nails were used and driven into auger holes, and thus the fabric was held together. Instead of oakum, coconut husk was used, and native cloth and dried banana stumps to caulk the seams, and make them watertight. The bark of a certain tree was spun into twine and rope by a rope machine made for the purpose, and a still more complex machine, namely a turning lathe, was constructed for the purpose of turning the block sheaves, while sails were made out of native mats, quilted to give them sufficient strength to resist the wind. By these means was completed, in about three months, a decked vessel of from seventy to eighty tons burden, about sixty feet long by eighteen broad. She was finally launched and named the Messenger of Peace, and truly a messenger of peace and glad tidings that she afterwards proved to be on many occasions among the islands of the southern seas. But our hero, John Jarwin, was not allowed to remain to see this happy consummation. He only looked and assisted at the commencement of the work. Many and many a time did he, during that trying period, argue with himself as to the propriety of his conduct in thus refusing the means of escape when it was thrown in his way, and there was not wanting now and then a suggestion from somewhere, he knew not where, 
but certainly it was not from outside of him, that perhaps the opportunity had been providentially thrown in his way. But Jarwin resisted these suggestions. He looked up, and reflected that he was there under a solemn promise, that but for his promise he should not have been there at all, and that, therefore, it was his peculiar duty at that time to whisper to himself continually, Honor bright. One morning Big Chief roused Jarwin with his toe and said, Get up. We go home now. What say, old man? Get ready. We go today. I have seen and heard enough. Big Chief was very stern, so that Jarwin thought it wise to hold his tongue and obey. There was a long, animated palaver between the chief, the missionary, and the king, but Jarwin had been carefully prevented from hearing it by his master, who ordered him to keep by the canoes, which were launched and ready. Once again he was assailed by an intense desire to escape, and this sudden approach of the time that it was perchance to fix his fate for life rendered him almost desperate. But he still looked up, and honor bright carried the day. He remained dumb to the last, and did not even allow himself the comfort of waving a piece of native cloth to the missionary, as he and his captors paddled from the Rarotonga shore. End of chapter 7 Recording by Estrabin Simonides Chapter 8 of Darwin and Cuffy by R. M. Ballantyne This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Chapter 8. Despair is followed by surprises and deliverance. At first, John Jarwin could not quite realize his true position after leaving Raritanga. The excitement consequent on the whole affair remained for some time on his mind, causing him to feel as if it were a dream, and it was not until he had fairly landed again on Big Chief's Island, and returned to his own little hut there, and had met with Cuffy, whose demonstrations of intense delight cannot by any possibility be described that he came fully to understand the value of the opportunity which he had let slip through his fingers. Poor Jarwin! Words failed to convey a correct idea of the depth of his despair, for now he saw clearly, as he thought, that perpetual slavery was his doom. Under the influence of the feelings that overwhelmed him, he became savage. "'Cuff,' said he, on the afternoon of the day of his return, "'it's all up with you and me, old chap.' The tone in which this was uttered was so stern that the terrier drooped its ears, lowered its tail, and looked up with an expression that was equivalent to, "'Don't kick me! Please don't!' Jarwin smiled a grim yet a pitiful smile as he looked at the dog. "'Yes, it's all up with us,' he continued. "'We shall live and die in slavery. What a fool I was not to cut and run when I had the chance!' The remembrance of honour bright flashed upon him here, but he was still savage, and therefore doggedly shut his eyes to it. At this point a message was brought to him from Big Chief, requesting his attendance in the royal hut. Jarwin turned angrily on the messenger, and bid him be gone in a voice of thunder, at the same time intimating, by a motion of his foot, that if he did not obey smartly he would quicken his motions for him. The messenger vanished, and Jarwin sat down beside Cuffy, who looked excessively humble, and vented his feelings thus. "'I can't stand it no longer, Cuff. I won't stand it. I'm going to bust up, I am, so look out for squalls.' A feeling of uncertainty as to the best method of busting up induced him to clutch his hair with both hands and snort. It must not be supposed that our hero gave way to such rebellious feelings with impunity. On the contrary, his conscience pricked him to such an extent that it felt like an internal pincushion or hedgehog. While he was still holding fast to his locks in meditative uncertainty, three natives appeared at the entrance of his hut, and announced that they had been sent by Big Chief to take him to the royal hut by force, in case he should refuse to go peaceably. Uttering a shout of defiance, the exasperated man sprang up and rushed at the natives, who, much too wise to await the onset, fled in three different directions. Instead of pursuing any of them, Jarwin went straight to the master's hut, where he found him seated on a couch of native cloth. Striding up to him, he clenched his fist, and holding it up in a threatening manner, exclaimed, <laughs> "'Now look here, big chief. It would be big thief if I had your right name. I ain't going to stand this sort of thing no longer. I kept my word to you all the time we was in Maritonga, but I'll keep it no longer.' I'll do my best to cut the cable and make sail the very first chance I gets, so I give you fair warning. Big Chief made no reply for some moments, but opened his eyes with such an intense expression of unaffected amazement that Darwin's wrath abated, in spite of his careful nursing of it to keep it warm. Jawin, he exclaimed at length, you Christian British tar, have your devil got into you? The question effectually routed our Darwin's anger. He knew that the savage to whom he had spoken at various times on the subject of satanic influence was perfectly sincere in his inquiry, as well as in his astonishment. 
Moreover, he himself felt surprised that Big Chief, who was noted for his readiness to resent insult, should have submitted to his angry tones and looks and threatening manner without the slightest evidence of indignation. The two men, therefore, stood looking at each other in silent surprise for a few moments. "'Big Chief,' Jarwin said at last, bringing his right fist down heavily into his left palm by way of emphasis, "'there's no dibble, as you call him, got possession of me. My own spirit is dibble enough, I find, to account for all that I've said and done, and a great deal more.' but it has been hard on me to see the door open as it were and not take advantage of it however it's all over now and i ask your parting i'll not mutiny again you've been a kind fellow to me old chap though you are a savage and i ain't ungrateful as long as i'm your slave i'll do my duty honour bright at the same time i think it fair and above board to let you know that i'll make my escape from you when i gets the chance i'm bound for to serve you while i eat your whittles but i am free to go if i can manage it there you may roast me alive and eat you if you like but you can't say after this that i'm sailing under false colours during this speech, a variety of expressions affected the countenance of Big Chief, but that of melancholy prevailed. Jawan, he said slowly, I like you. You're a good hired old buffer, said Jarwin, grasping the chief's hand and squeezing it. To say the truth, I'm very fond of yourself, but it's natural that I should like my freedom better. Big Chief pondered this for some time and shook his head slowly, as if the, the results of his meditation was not satisfactory. Jawan, he resumed after a pause, sing me a song. Well, you are a queer codger said Jarwin, laughing in spite of himself. If ever there was a man I didn't feel up to singing, that's me at this moment. However, I suppose it must be done. What'll you have? Ben Bolt, Black-Eyed Susan, The Jolly Young Watermelon, Jim Crow, There is a Happy Land, or The Old Hundred, eh? Only say the word and I'll turn on the steam. Big Chief made no reply. As he appeared to be lost in meditation, Jarwin sat down, and in a species of desperation began to bellow with all the strength of his lungs one of those nautical ditties with which seamen are wont to enliven the movements of the windlass or the capstan. He changed the tune several times, and at length slid gradually into a more gentle and melodious vein of song, while Big Chief listened with evident pleasure. Still there was perceptible to Jarwin a dash of sadness in his master's countenance that he had never seen before. Wondering at this, and changing the tunes to suit his own varying moods, he gradually came to plaintive songs, and then to psalms and hymns. At last Big Chief seemed satisfied, and bid his slave good night. "'He's a wonderful character,' remarked Jarwin to Cuffy, as he lay down to rest that night. "'A most unaccountable sound of man. There's something working in his head, though what it may be is more nor I can tell. Perhaps he's going to spliffocate me in consequence of my impudence. If so, Cuff, whatever will become of you, my poor doggie?' Cuffy nestled very close to his master's side at this point, and whined in a pitiful tone, as if he really understood the purport of his remarks. In five minutes more he was giving vent to occasional mild little whines and half-barks, indicating that he was in the land of dreams, and Jarwin's nose was creating sounds which told that its owner had reached that blessed asylum of the weary, oblivion. Next day our sailor awakened to the consciousness of the fact that the sun was shining brightly, that parakeets were chattering gaily, that Cuffy was still sleeping soundly, that the subjects of Big Chief were making an unusual uproar outside. Starting up and pulling on a pair of remarkably ancient canvas trousers, which his master had graciously permitted him to retain and wear, Jarwin looked out at the door of his hut and became aware of the fact that the whole tribe was assembled in the spot where national palavers were wont to be held. The house appeared to be engaged at the time in the discussion of some exceedingly naughty question, a sort of national education bill or church endowment scheme, for there was great excitement, much gesticulation, and very loud talk accompanied with not a little angry demonstration on the part of the disputants. "'Hello! What's up?' inquired Jarman of a stout savage who stood at his door, armed with a club, on the head of which human teeth formed a conspicuous ornament. "'Balaver!' replied the savage. "'It's easy to see and hear that,' replied Jarman. "'But what is it all about?' The savage vouchsafed no farther reply, but continued to march up and down in front of the hut. Jarwin, therefore, assayed to quit his abode, but was stopped by the taciturn savage, who said that he must consider himself a prisoner until the palaver had come to an end. He was therefore fain to content himself with standing at his door and watching the gesticulations of the members of council. Big Chief was there, of course, and appeared to take a prominent part in the proceedings, but there were other chiefs of the tribe whose opinions had much weight, though they were inferior to him in position. At last they appeared to agree, and finally, with a shout, the whole band rushed off in the direction of the temple where their idols were kept. Darwin's guard had manifested intense excitement during the closing scene, and when this last act took place, he threw down his club, forsook his post, and followed his comrades. Of course, Darwin availed himself of the opportunity and went to see what was being done. 
to his great surprise he found that the temple was being dismantled while the idols were carried down to the palaver ground if we may so call it and thrown into a heap there with marks of indignity and contempt knowing as he did the superstitious reverence with which the natives regarded their idols jarwin beheld this state of things with intense amazement and he looked on with increasing interest hoping ere long to discover some clue to the mystery but his hopes were disappointed for big chief caught sight of him and sternly ordered him back to his cut where another guard was placed over him this guard was more strict than the previous one had been he would not even allow his prisoner to look at what was taking place under the circumstances therefore there was nothing for it but to fall back on philosophic meditation and converse with cuffy these were rather poor resources however to a man who was surrounded by a tribe of excited savages despite his natural courage and coolness jarwin felt as he said himself rather uncomfortable towards the afternoon things became a little more quiet still no notice was taken of our hero save that his meals were sent to him from the chief's hut he wondered at this greatly for nothing of the kind had ever befallen before and he began to entertain vague suspicions that such treatment might possibly be the prelude to evil of some kind following him he questioned his guard several times but that functionary told him that big chief had bidden him refuse to hold converse with him on any subject whatever being as the reader knows a practical matter-of-fact sort of man our hero at last resigned himself to his fate whatever that might be and beguiled the time by making many shrewd remarks and observations to cuffy when the afternoon meal was brought to him he heaved a deep sigh and apparently with that effort flung off all his anxieties come along cuff he said in a hearty voice sitting down to dinner let's grub together and be thankful for small mercies anyhow whatever turns up you and i shall go halves and stick by one another to the last not that i have any doubts of big chief cuffy you mustn't suppose that but then you see he ain't the only chief in the island and if all the rest was to go again him he couldn't do much to save us the dog of course replied in his usual facetious manner with eyes and tail and sat down with its ears cocked and its head turned inspectively on one side while the sailor removed the palm leaf covering of the basket which contained the provisions sent to him what have we here cuffy he said soliloquizing and looking earnestly in let me see bit of baked pig good cuff good that's the stuff to make us fat what next roast fish that's not bad cuff not bad though hardly equal to the pig here we have a leaf full of plantains and another of yams excellent grub that my doggy nothing could be better what's this coconut full of its own milk the best to drink it cheers as the old song or the old poet says but it don't inebriate that was said in regard to tea you know it holds good in respect of coconut milk and it's far better than grog cuffy far better though you can't know nothing about that but you may take my word for it happy is the man as drinks nothing stronger than coconut milk or tea hello what's this plums my doggy they're uncommon good to us to-day i wonder what's up i say jarwin paused as he drew the last dish out of the prolific basket and looked earnestly at his dog while he lay it down i say what if they should have taken it into their heads to fatten us up before killing us that's not a very agreeable notion is it eh apparently cuffy was of the same opinion for he did not wag even the point of his tail and there was something dubious in the glance of his eye as he waited for more well well it ain't no use surmisin observed the seaman with another sigh what we've got for to do now is to eat our vittles and hope for the best here you are cuff catch throwing a lump of baked pig to his dog the worthy man fell to with a keen appetite and gave himself no further anxiety as to the probable or possible events of the future dinner concluded he would fain have gone out for a ramble on the shore as he had been wont to do in time past but his jailer forbid him to quit the hut he was therefore about to console himself with a siesta when an unexpected order came from big chief requiring his immediate attendance in the royal hut jarwin at once obeyed the mandate and in a few minutes stood before his master who was seated on a raised couch and drawing a cup of coconut milk i have sent for you began big chief with solemnity to have a palaver sit down you british tar all right old chap replied jarwin seating himself on a stool opposite to his master what is it to be about joe win rejoined big chief with deepening gravity you's been well treated here big chief spoke in broken english now having picked it up with amazing facility from his white slave well yes i'm free to confess that i has been well treated barrin the fact that my liberty's been took away besides which some of your old black rascals ain't quite so civil as they might be but on the whole i've been well treated anyhow i never received nothing but kindness from you old codger he extended his hand frankly and big chief who had been taught the meaning of our english method of salutation grasped it warmly and shook it with such vigour that he would certainly have discomposed darwin had that richest star been a less powerful man he performed this ceremony with the utmost sadness however and continued to shake his head in such a melancholy way that his white slave began to feel quite anxious about him hello old feller you ain't been took bad have ye big chief made no reply but continued to shake his head slowly 
Then, as if a sudden idea had occurred to him, he rose, and, grasping Jarwin by his whiskers with both hands, rubbed noses with him, after which he resumed his seat on the couch. "'Just so,' observed our hero with a smile. "'You shake hands with me English fashion. I rub nose with you South Sea fashion. Give and take, all right, old codger. May our friendship last forever, as the old song puts it. What about this here palaver you spoke of? It weren't merely to rub our beaks together that you sent for me, I fancy. It is a song you want, or him? Only say the word, and I'm your man.' "'I suppose,' said Big Chief, using, of course, Jarwin's sea phraseology, only still farther broken, "'you'd up anger and make sail most quick if you could, eh?' "'Well, although I has a liking for you, old man,' replied the sailor, "'I can't but feel a sort of preference, do you see, for my own wife and children. "'Therefore I would cut my cable if I had the chance.' "'Kite right, kite right,' replied Big Chief with a deep sigh. "'You say it's unnatural. Good, good, so it is. "'Now, Jarwin.' continued the savage chief, with intense earnestness. He is free to go when you pleases. Oh, gammon, replied Jarwin with an unbelieving grin. What is gammon? demanded Big Chief, with a somewhat disappointed look. Well, it don't matter what it means. It's nothing or nonsense, if you like. But what do you mean, old man? That's the rub, as Hamlet, or some such character, said to his father-in-law. You ain't in earnest, are ye? Jarwin, answered the chief with immovable gravity. I not understand you. What do you mean by earnest? He did not wait for a reply, however, but seizing Jarwin by the wrist and looking into his eyes with an expression of childlike earnestness that effectually solemnized his white slave, continued, "'Listen, understand me. I is a Christian. My brother chiefs and I have watched you many days. You have always do what is right, no matter what trouble follows to you. You do this for love of your God, your Saviour, so you tells me. Good, I do not need much for lover. When the sun shines, it am hot. When not shines, am cold.' What more? Cookie missionary have said the truth. My slave have proved the truth. I love you, Jowen. I love your God. I keep you if possible, but Christian must not have slave. Go, you is free. You don't mean that, old man, cried Jarwin, starting up with flashing eyes and seizing his master's hand. You is free, repeated Big Chief. We need not relate all that honest John Jarwin did and said after that. Let it suffice to record his closing remarks that night to Cuffy. Cuffy he said, patting the shaggy head of his humble friend, Many a strange thing crops up in this here curious world, but it never did occur to my mind before, that while a learned man like a missionary might state the truth, the likes of me should have the chance and the power to prove it. That's a very curious fact. So you and I shall go to sleep on it, my doggie. Good night. End of chapter 8 Recording by Esther ben Simonides. Chapter Nine of Jarwin and Cuffy by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther ben Simonides. Chapter Nine, the last. That Jarwin's deliverance from slavery was not a dream, but a blessed reality, was proved to him next day beyond all doubt by the singular proceedings of Big Chief and his tribe. Such of the native idols as had not been burned on the previous day were brought out, collected into a heap, and publicly burned, after which the whole tribe was settled on the palavering ground, and Big Chief made a long, earnest, and animated speech, in which he related all that he had seen of his white slave's conduct at the island of Rarotonga, and stated how that conduct had proved to him, more conclusively than anything else he had heard or seen, that the religion of the white missionaries was true. While this was being spoken, many sage reflections were passing through Jarwin's mind, and a feeling of solemn thankfulness filled him when he remembered how narrowly he had escaped doing inconceivable damage by giving way to temptation and breaking his word. He could not avoid perceiving that, if he had not been preserved in a course of rectitude all through his terrible trial, at a time when he thought no one was thinking about him, not only would Big Chief and his nation have probably remained in heathen superstition, and continued to practice all the horrid and bloody rites which that superstition involved, but its own condition of slavery would, in all probability, have been continued and rendered permanent, for Big Chief and his men were numerous and powerful enough to have held their own against the Rarotongans, while at the same time it was probable that he would have lost his master's regard, as he would certainly have lost his respect." he could not help reflecting also how much the cause of christianity must often suffer in consequence of the conduct of many seamen calling themselves christian who visit the south sea islands and lead dissolute abandoned lives while there some of these he knew brought this credit on the name of jesus thoughtlessly 
and would perhaps be solemnized and sorry if they knew the terrible results of their conduct, while others he knew cared nothing for Christianity or for anything in the world except the gratification of their own selfish desires. While he was yet pondering these things, they chief advanced toward him, and, taking him by the hand, led him into the center of the concourse. To his great surprise and confusion, the tall tree said, Now, Jawan will palaver to you. He is one British tar, one Christian. He can tell us what we shall do. Saying this, Big Chief sat down, and left Jawan standing in the midst, scratching his head, and looking with extreme perplexity at the vast sea of black faces and glittering eyes which were directed towards him. Why, you know, old man, it ain't fair of you, this ain't, he said, addressing himself to Big Chief. You've took me all aback like a white squall. How do you suppose that I can tell you what to do? I ain't a parson, no, not even a clerk or a parish beetle. To this Big Chief vouchsafed no further reply than, Bolaver, you British tar. Very good, exclaimed Jarwin, turning round and looking full at his audience, while a bright smile lit up his sunburnt countenance, as if a sudden idea had occurred to him. I'll do my best to palaver. Here goes, then, for a yarn. Jarwin spoke, of course, in the native tongue, which we translate into his own language. Big chief, small chief, and niggers in general, he began, with a wave of his right hand. You've called on me for a speech. Good. I'm your man. I'm a British tar, as your great chief says truly. That's a fact, and I'm a Christian. I hope. God knows I've sometimes my own doubts as to that same, but the doubts ain't with reference to the Almighty, they're chiefly as regards myself. However, to come to the point, you've gone and burnt your idols. Ho! Oh! exclaimed the whole assembly, with a degree of energy that made a deep impression on the sailor, just as one might be impressed when he has been permitted to become the happy medium of achieving some great end which he had never dreamed of being privileged to accomplish. Well, then, continued Jarquin, that is a good thing anyhow, for it's a disgrace to human nature, not to speak of common sense and other things, to worship stocks and stones, when the Bible distinctly tells you not to do it. You've done right in that matter, and glad I am to hear big from chief that you intend, after this, to follow the truth. Old man and niggers, cried Jarwin, warming up, to my mind, the highest thing that a man can devote himself to, the following out and fallen in with the truth. To suppose that chemists and engineers and doctors was to follow lies, why, what would come of it? Confusion was confounded. In course, therefore, they carefully tries to follow what's true, though I'm bound for to say they do get off the track now and then. Well, if it's so with such like, it's much more so with religion. What then? Why, stand by your colors, through thick and thin. Hold on to the Bible. That's the watchword. That's your sheet anchor, though you haven't seen one yet. It's good holding ground, is the Bible. It's the only holding ground. How does I know that, says you? It ain't easy for me to give you an offhand answer to that, any more than it is to give you an offhand answer to a complicated question in the rule of three. A parson can do it, no doubt, but the likes of me can only show a sort of reflected light like the moon. Nevertheless, we may show a true light, the reflected. Chiefs and niggers, there's asses in every generation, young asses chiefly, as think they've found out something new in regard to the Bible, and then runs it down. And then fellers grow old and sticks to their opinions, and they thinks themselves wise, and other people thinks them wise because they're old, as if oldness make them wise. Why are they asses? Why, because they form their opinions early in life, in opposition to men what has studied these matters all through their lives. Having hoisted their colors, they nails them to the mast, and there they are. They never goes at the investigation of the subject, as a man investigates mathematics, or navigation, or logarithms, so they're like a ship at sea without a chart. Niggers, no man can claim to be wise unless he can render a reason. He may be, perhaps, but he can't claim to be. I believe the Bible's true because of two facts. First of all, men of the highest intellect have found it true, and tried it, and practiced its teachings, and rested their souls on it. In the second place, as the parsons say, I have tried it, and found it true as far as I've gone. I've sailed according to the chart, and have struck on no rocks or shoals as yet. I've been wary near to it, but thank God I wasn't allowed to take the wrong course altogether, though I've got to confess that I wanted to, many a time. Now, what does all this here come to? demanded Jarwin, gazing round on his audience, who were intensely interested, though they did not understand much of what he said. What does it come to? Why, that having wisely given up your idols, and taken to the true God, the next best thing you can do is to go off at once to Rarotonga, and get the best advice you can from those what are trained for to give it. I can't say no fairer than that, for— as to asking advice on religious matters from the likes of me, why, the thing's perfectly ridiculous. Jarwin sat down, amid a murmur of applause. In a few minutes, an old chief rose to reply. His words were to the effect that, although there was so much in their white brother's speech beyond their understanding, 
which was not to be wondered at, considering that he was so learned, and they so ignorant. There was one part of it which he thoroughly agreed with, namely, that a party should be sent to Rarotonga to inform the cookie missionaries as to what had taken place, to ask advice, and to beg one of the cookies to come and live permanently on their island, and teach them the Christian religion. Another chief followed with words and sentiments to much the same effect. Then Big Chief gave orders that the canoes for the deputation should be got ready without delay, and the meeting broke up with loud shouts and other pleasant demonstrations. Matters having been thus satisfactorily arranged, Jaron returned to his hut with a grateful heart to meditate on the happy turn that had taken place in his prospects. Finding the hut not quite congenial to his frame of mind, and observing that the day was unusually fine, he resolved to ramble in the cool shades of a neighboring wood. Come, Cuff, my doggy, you and I shall go for a walk this fine day. We have much to think about and talk over, do you see, which is best done in solitary places. Need we say that Cuffy responded with intense enthusiasm to this invitation, and that his spanker boom became violently demonstrative as he followed his master into the wood? Jarwin still wore, as we have said, his old canvas trousers, which had been patched and repatched to such an extent with native cloth that very little of the original fabric was visible. The same may be said of his old flannel shirt, to which he clung with affectionate regard, so long after it had ceased to be capable of clinging to him without patchwork strengthening. The remnants of his straw hat, also, had been carefully kept together, so that with the exception of the paint on his face, which Big Chief insisted on his wearing, and the huge South Sea club which he carried habitually for protection, he was still a fair specimen of a British tar. Parakeets were chattering happily, rills were trickling down the hillsides, fruit and flower trees perfumed the air, and everything looked bright and beautiful, in pleasant accordance with the state of Jarwin's feelings, while the two friends wandered away through the woods in dreamy enjoyment of the past and present, and with hopeful anticipations in regard to the future. Jarwin said something to this effect to Cuffy, and put it to him seriously to admit the truth of what he said, which that wise dog did at once, if there be any a truth in the old saying that silence is consent. After wandering for several hours, they came out of the wood at a part of the coast which lay several miles distant from Big Chief's village. Here to his surprise and alarm, he discovered two war canoes in the act of running on the beach. He drew back at once and endeavored to conceal himself, for he knew too well that this was a party from a distant land, the principal chief of which had threatened more than once to make an attack on Big Chief and his tribe. But Darwin had been observed, and was immediately pursued, and his retreat cut off by hundreds of yelling savages. Seeing this, he ran down to the beach, and, taking up a position on a narrow spit of land, flourished his ponderous club and stood at bay. Cuffy placed himself close behind his master, and, glaring between his legs at the approaching savages, displayed all his teeth and snarled fiercely. One, who appeared to be a chief, ran straight at our hero, brandishing a club similar to his own. Darwin had become by that time well practiced in the use of his weapon. He evaded the blow dealt at him, and fetched the savage such a whack on the small of his back as he passed him, that he fell flat on the sand and lay there. Cuffy rushed at him and seized him by the throat, an act which induced another savage to launch a javelin at the dog. It grazed his back, cut it partly open, and sent him yelling into the woods. Meanwhile, Jarwin was surrounded, and, although he felled three or four of his assailants, was quickly overpowered by numbers, gagged, lashed tight to a pole so that he could not move, and laid in the bottom of one of the war canoes. Even when in this sad plight, the sturdy steaman did not lose heart, for he well knew that Cuffy, being wounded and driven from his master's side, would run straight home to his master's hut, and that Big Chief would at once suspect, from the nature of the wound and the circumstance of the dog being alone, that it was necessary for him and his men of war to take the field. Darwin, therefore, felt very hopeful that he should be speedily rescued. But such hopes were quickly dispelled when, after a noisy dispute on the beach, the savages, who owned the canoe in which he lay, suddenly re-embarked and pushed off to sea, leaving the other canoe and its crew on the beach. Hour after hour passed, but the canoemen did not relax their efforts. Straight out to sea they went, and when the sun set, Big Chief's island was utterly sunk beneath the horizon. Now, indeed, a species of wild despair filled the breast of the poor captive. To be thus seized, and doomed in all probability to perpetual bondage, when the cup of regained liberty had only just touched his lips, was very hard to bear. When he first fully realized his situation, he struggled fiercely to burst his bonds, but the men who had tied him knew how to do their work. He struggled vainly until he was exhausted. Then, looking up into the starry sky, his mind became gradually composed, and he had recourse to prayer. Slumber ere long sealed his eyes, setting him free in imagination and he did not again waken until daylight was beginning to appear. All that day he lay in the same position, without water or food, 
cramped by the cords that bound him and almost driven mad by the heat of an unclouded sun still onward went the canoe propelled by men who appeared to require no rest night came again and jarwin by that time nearly exhausted fell into a troubled slumber from this he was suddenly aroused by loud wild cries and shouts as of men engaged in deadly conflict and he became aware of the fact that the canoe in which he lay was attacked for the warriors had thrown down their paddles and seized their clubs and their feet chowed now on his chest now on his face as they staggered to and fro in a few minutes several dead wounded men fell on him then he became unconscious when john jarwin's powers of observation returned he found himself lying on his back in a neat little bed with white cotton curtains and a small comfortably furnished room that reminded him powerfully of home cuffy lay on the counterpane sound asleep with his chin on his master's breast at the bedside with her back to him sat a female dressed in european clothes and busy sewing surely it ain't been an all-along dream whispered jarwin to himself cuffy coughed his ears and head and turned a furtive glance on his master's face while his banker broom rose with the evident intention to wag if circumstances rendered it advisable but circumstances had of late been rather perplexing to cuffy at the same time the female turned quickly round and revealed a brown though pleasant face simultaneously a gigantic figure arose at his side and bent over him you's better said the gigantic figure hello big chief what's up old feller exclaimed jarwin hold you's dung said big chief sternly go away he added to the female who with an acquiescent smile left the room well this is queer and i feels queer queery what's the meaning of it you's been bad jarwin answered big chief gravely were we bad dead almost now you's going to be better doctor say that doctor exclaimed jarwin in surprise what doctor doctor of ship him's come every day for to see you ship cried jarwin springing up in bed and glaring at big chief in wonder lie down you christian british star said the chief sternly at the same time laying his large hand on the sailor's chest with a degree of force that rendered resistance useless hold you's tongue and listen doctor say you not for speak me tell you all about it first place continued big chief you's been bad consequence of the blackguards having jump on you's face and stomach but we give em awful lickin jawin oh smash up them down and right and left got you out your canoe dead i think but no not just so bring you here raratonga the cooking missionary and his wife not here away and ship you see them make native teacher here that teacher's wife been nurse you and go away just now ship comes here for trade bound for england ums got doctor doctor come see you shake ums head looks long time say he put you all right four weeks since dat now you was all right the last words he uttered with much anxiety depicted on his countenance for he had been so often deceived of late by jarwin having occasional lucid intervals in the midst of his delirium that his faith in him had been shaken all right exclaimed jarwin ay right as a trivet bound for england did he say the ship big chief nodded and looked very sad you go home he asked softly jarwin was deeply touched he seized the big man's hand and not being strong failed to restrain a tear or two big chief being very strong in feelings as well as in frame burst into tears cuffy being utterly incapable of making head or tail of it gave vent to a prolonged dismal howl which changed to a bark and whine of satisfaction when his master laughed patted him and advised him not to be so free in the use of his spanker boom four weeks later and jarwin with cuffy by his side stood himself again on the quarter deck of the nancy of hull while the yo heave ho of the sailors rang an accompaniment to the clatter of the windlass as they weighed anchor big chief held his hand in web and rubbed noses with him to such an extent that the cabin boy said it was a perfect mural that they had a scrap of nose left on their faces i would not be consoled by the assurance that he jarwin would certainly make another voyage to the south seas if he should be spared to do so an occasion offered for the express purpose of paying him a visit at last he tore himself away got into his canoe and remained gazing in speechless sorrow after the homeward bound vessel as she shook out her topsails to the breeze despite his efforts poor jarwin was so visibly affected at parting from his old kind master that the steward of the ship a sympathetic man was induced to offer him a glass of grog and a pipe he accepted both mechanically still gazing with earnest looks at the fast receding canoe 
Presently he raised the glass to his lips, and his nose became aware of the long-forgotten order. The current of his thoughts was violently changed. He looked intently at the glass and then at the pipe. "'Drink,' said the sympathetic steward, "'and take a whiff. It'll do you good.' "'Drink? Whiff?' exclaimed Jerome, while the dark frown gathered on his brow. "'There, old Father Neptune,' he cried, tossing the glass and pipe overboard. "'You drink and whiff if you choose. John Jarwin has done with drinking and whiffing forever. "'Thanks to you, all the same, no offence meant,' he added in a gentler tone, "'turning the astonished steward and patting him on the shoulder. "'But if you had suffered all that I have suffered, through being a slave to the glass and pipe, "'when I thought I was no slave, mark you, and would have laughed at anyone to scorn who said I was, "'if you seed me groanin' and yearnin' and dreamin' of backy and grog, as I have done, when I couldn't get neither of em for love or money, you wouldn't wonder that I ain't going to be such a born fool as to go and sell myself over again. Turning quickly towards the shore, as if regretting that he should, for a moment, have appeared to forget his old friend, he pulled out his handkerchief and waved it over the side. Big Chief replied energetically with a scrap of native cloth, not having got the length of handkerchiefs at that time. "'Look at him, Cuff!' exclaimed Jarwin, placing his dog on the bulwarks of the ship. Look at him, Cuff, and wag your spanker boom to him, too. Ay, that's right, for he's as kind-hearted a nigger as ever owned a British tar for a slave. He said no more, but continued to wave his handkerchief at intervals, until the canoe seemed a mere speck on the horizon, and after it was gone, he and his little dog continued to gaze sadly at the island, as it grew fainter and fainter until it sank at last into the great bosom of the Pacific Ocean. The next land seen by Jarwin and Cuffy was the White Cliffs of Old England. End of chapter 9 Recording by Esther Ben Simonides End of Jarwin and Cuffy by R. M. Valentine